For those of you who've just tuned in, you're thankful that Brad Stein has issues is still going strong. Me, I'm happy that I'm wearing a shirt that isn't Wyatt, so I'm not going to get lambasted by him on a regular basis. Oh, thank goodness. I'm thankful that my son, who exuded from my loins, is still here, going strong, being my sidekick, and hanging in there while we banter back and forth, and I, of course, always get the better end of the stick. I'm thankful that we live in a country that, though teetering on the edge of totalitarianism and pure destruction and complete uh, failure to uh, hold on to the Constitution and instead descend into tyranny, totalitarianism and Marxism, driven by the atheist ideology that has no morality and thus can butcher, destroy and rape at, and pillage because there's no morality it has to answer to. I'm thankful that we're still here not going yet to that spot. I'm thankful that my wife is still hanging in there no matter how many years we've been together and her having to put up with me couldn't have been easy. I'm thankful that my friends, my people, my fans, if you want to call it that, show up every Monday night, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time to see if there might be something happening in the earth that I can unravel and shine a little clarity on. They're wondering if perhaps God will reveal himself to those of us who don't believe, and those who do will believe even deeper. I'm grateful and thankful that we continue to sit here and do the best we can to inspire, hopefully bring a few laughs, and in the end, see if we can actually find some truth that's worth fighting for. Can't guarantee it. Remember, it is a podcast after all. But the good news is I'm thankful that to prove it's a real podcast and not some run-of-the-mill fly-by-night that's trying to hang on by the seat of his pants. No, it's a real one. How do you know? Because of the Spotify downloads? No. Because of the YouTube channel, Brad Stein has issues, subscriptions growing daily? No. Because of the Apple podcast system that I'm involved? No. Now, the reason you know this is a good old-fashioned go grab them by the horns and wrestle them to the ground podcast. It's because it has a song. And that song goes like this. Well, I don't see it anymore. Hey, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. My name, Brad Stein. My moniker, God's Comic. This, Brad Stein Has Issues, a live podcast. Apparently, that's rare. And it's a podcast where comedy, conservatism, and Christianity collide. In a cacophony of clarity, I am God's Comic, Brad Stein. Getting older, but not long in the tooth. Hanging in there, doing the best I can, and trying to be the face of this amazing podcast. But I couldn't do it alone. Well, I could, but I have to say that, otherwise he'll turn off my mic. I got my son. There it goes. I got my son, Wyatt. He's my sidekick. Just to remind you. Yes, I know who's in control of my mic. Uh, but this um, is my son, Wyatt. How are you, son? Uh, well, I'm doing okay, I guess. Even though Nick Kress and Carrie Tudor are watching? Uh, yeah. Uh, even though they all, yes, I'm doing fine. It's, it, it it's really just... It's loads, isn't it? it? it it's loads. I'm sorry, it's, I know, it, look, it's the season for being thankful, and if there's one thing that I am thankful for, it is getting to work at a company where you never really know what you're going to expect to see when you walk through those doors. Well, you've let us in on that. You've given us incredible Lowe's stories. Some that of my has... favorite moments. Oh, and, and people uh, are on the edge of their seats wondering what Lowe's can do incompetently next. And yet, here we sit, and they're, they've been a fine employee to you, and they've given mm -hmm. you wonderful stories. Are you trying to tell me, and I, I hate to even venture in this, because one day it's going to be, we're going to use up all the stories, but are you mm -hmm. telling me there's, there's another Lowe's story above the horizon? Uh, 
it's a shorter one. That's but it's it. definitely, definitely a moment that I'll never forget. Do tell. Okay, so I'm just walking. Yeah. Down the aisle, just, you know, seeing if anyone needs help. Now, this is the aisle that had the syringe on it? Yes, actually <laughs> the exact same one. Ha <laughs> ha Did the syringe reappear? Thankfully, no. Okay. So, as I'm walking, yeah. I see at the far end of the aisle, there's a guy in one of those uh, handicapped scooter things. Yes! So, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe he needs help. So, I, I walk over. So, you are immediately insulting him by assuming he's a... Handicapped oh, human oh, yeah, oh, yes, I am, I am a bona just, fide ableist. You I are will, jumping to conclusion. Okay, so you're ableizing him, <laughs> yeah. and then what happens? Okay, so I go, and I, I, tell, I ask this guy, hello, do you, uh, is everything all right? Unfortunately, the nanosecond, like the literal instant before those words leave my mouth, Mm. I just hear the guy go talk to his friend and just say, man, I hate loaves. Mm. So you can imagine how that conversation went. Okay. So, so li literally, I hear that, and at this point, I'm already talking, so I, I can't stop. I'm yeah. committed right. to basically being the most uh, either ironic or insulting, depending on how you're viewing it, mm. question that I possibly could have asked this guy. And this response is, no, I'm not all right. So apparently, the, guy, the guy's story is, he recently had surgery mm. on his knee. Mm. They, he went to Lowe's mm. to, I guess, celebrate that? But he needed one of the mobility scooters. Okay. But it was sandwiched in between another one and he injured his knee again <laughs> getting it out despite the fact that may I remind you he had somebody else to help him okay and the person he was with is basically like like obviously he's insanely annoyed and just very unhelpful uncooperative but it's the other person who really shows that to me. Okay. Because they're like, oh, where is a manager? We want to talk to a manager. How many times have you heard that? Like anyone complaining about retail jobs? Okay. How many times have you heard of that line? Mm. As like a, a common complaint that retail employees have. Like, yeah, oh. 10 times a day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so I, five, like two minutes ago, I f saw one of the assistant managers. We just we had to talk and he left. Hmm. And then this happened and I'm like, oh, right over here. I turned the aisle and he's gone. Hmm. So now I'm looking, we I'm looking ridiculous. Hmm. <laughs> and they are not happy. No. <laughs> so eventually I'm thinking to myself, okay, okay, th there's got to be somebody else walking here who I can pawn off as the manager. Uh, uh, oh, those people in Lumbo. I see one of them, the guy in the middle. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the manager. He can help you. He actually was mm. the assistant manager. And she's like, oh, well, hey, that's not helpful. Which one is it? And I'm just like, the, the, the one I said was the assistant manager, the, the, the middle one. That, did, did, did you not hear me? So luckily, I was able to get them distracted enough for me to run away. Yes. And I never saw them again. Yeah, thank God. Honestly, handled it brilliantly, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Right. So, they just hated Lowe's because he hurt his knee? Or, again. Or, no, 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 no. Because the man who injured himself, who, who was injured, injured himself again, even though he didn't have to, by any stretch. Is he going to sue Lowe's for the oh, injury? Oh, I, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, because... God forbid I mean, you make a mistake and then you hold yourself responsible. That's uh, not going to happen. I mean, look, not in America in 2023, son. I mean, look, worst case scenario, mm. we win and we get paid money or something and I get a raise. Best case scenario, we lose, I get sacked for to pay the legal fees and I move on to Lego store. <laughs> Lego store. Yeah, that I, would I, be yeah, so I right did. There. I did. Uh, Put in my application for Lego Store, by the way. Did you really? Well, I, I almost did. Okay. They need a resume. 
Oh. I do not currently have one. Okay. I have the things you need to get one, right. like experience. You just haven't put it together. But I, I, don't, I, I didn't think I needed one. Okay. Who, who, need, who thinks you need a resume to be a seasonal employee at a Lego store? Uh, well, aren't they Danish? Uh, I, I think they're Danish. So yeah. they're probably Danish. just, that's how they run things. It's just by the book. There's no nuance to it. It's Legos. It's bricks well, I'm that just connect. Saying, I have almost three years in, of retail experience. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing. Yeah, but they don't know that. They don't know you're just making it's crap. It's literally properly. one of the questions is, do you have any previous experience? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking why, of previous... Why do they need a resume if they're already going to ask me all the questions on the resume? Well, it just shows that you can, you know, put together a, a, a cohesive uh, evaluation of yourself, that you can write. It shows that you're willing to places. blindly follow orders without questioning it. Yes. They want to make sure that you're going to be a great uh, sheep to do exactly as they command. It, I, don't, I feel like there could be a better animal we can use to describe it. If they're a Danish company, like, what's a common Danish animal? Oh, uh, Danish animal? Is that what you're asking well, me? Well, because, well, you know, there are some animals that are in... Cow. Cows are in Daneland. Uh, no, okay, you don't understand. Cheese there and stuff. There are some animals that you, chocolate you comes think from, of them. Yeah. And you just instinctually know yeah. they're from that place. Like, for instance, mm. um, I don't actually have any examples. Kangaroo. Of Kangaroo, Australia. Hey, koala. Also Australia. New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, uh, penguins, uh, Antarctica. Okay. Uh, uh, Boa constrictor. Oh, Boa constrictor. Probably also Australia. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, turkeys from Turkey. Okay. Um, well, uh, okay. Lion. 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 The Amazon. Africa. Africa, yes. Uh, Sweden. Fish. Yeah, Swedish fish. <laughs> Who doesn't love that? Why, well, I got to say hi to these folks. They're no. getting upset. The, 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 the natives are restless. Marsha Pointer Reed, good evening, Brad and White, and everybody. Plenty Flowers is back, making homemade Christmas cards to send. You think she'll send it's one to you and I? It's not even Chris. It's not even December. Wyatt, will she send one to you and I is the only thing I want to know. I don't, what do you mean, and I? I don't know. There's only one popular person in this podcast. Who? Moi. Huh. I, I'm, I'm sorry, how many autographs have you signed? I've signed no autographs! Exactly. Have you? No, because I forgot that we don't have a stamp and envelope. I can't oh send Lord. it. Can you believe that? Isn't it? We're so, you're so emaily. Also, I'll bet you you have never sent a letter with a stamp in your life. I have. It's just we... That was before the time of the internet was a thing. We literally... I've scoured this house. We don't own an envelope that I could find. Okay. Or stamp that I can find. Okay. Well. And also, um, I tried to write the signature. Yeah. And then I got writer's block, <laughs> writing my own name. Because you don't know how to write cursive. Oh, I can write cursive just fine. You just scribble like a doctor does, mm. and nobody can tell the difference. No, From the, the, da da a Danish doctor. Yeah, exactly. All right. the, the issue I'm having oh. with this autograph is I'm not sure if I should add like a personal, because like I've seen autographs. Like I've seen pictures of autographed things. Mm. Sometimes it's just the the actual name, but other times they add like these tiny little messages. Yeah, and I just feel like going the extra mile. Mm. Except I'm lost and I don't have a map. Wyatt, who are you writing this uh, autograph to? Um, a Ash. No, it's uh, I. I know this. Don't don't uh, d d d talk to the audience. Give me a second. Michael Quackenbush, good evening, my brothers and sisters. I hope everyone has had a blessed start to their week. Me too. Jim Brona, hey guys. Always good to see, be with you every Monday night, of course. Carlin Boyd, happy Thanksgiving, everyone, of course. T.W. Smith, I'll be over on YouTube listening for the answer to that intriguing question I asked. Did he ask one? I didn't see it. Uh, uh who? Uh, T.W. Smith. T.W. Smith, I am not seeing any comment question. But he said he's going the over to YouTube. He's the guy that's always on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, the only uh, thing he said so far is greetings, brands, and... Loin boy. Wyatt, Ched Sheds things. here. Ched Sheds here with two, uh, three illuminated hands. Louis Leon. Uh, hey, Brad, Wyatt, and friends. Danny Herring's back. Thank you, sweetheart. I hope you're doing oh, good. I'll, I'll and I hope you. you've got some plenty of snowshoes and syrup. Where is she from, Wyatt? Who? Danny Herring. Canada. Also, it's Ashley Hatch. 
Haz, I think is how you pronounce that. I don't know. Haz. Look, look I, I, I don't, I can't pronounce it. Well, let me explain something to you about Ashley Haas. I met her. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, we put her picture up last week. Or, yes. And the did. reason we put her picture up is because I met her because she came to a show. She came yes. to a show because mm-hmm. she happens to like my comedy. And then she happens to watch our podcast. And then she happened to say to me, what's it going to cost me to get an autograph from Wyatt? I'm still and working on that. I'm thinking 24 standard, 44 personalized message. <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe 20, uh, $30 basic but like uh, a do- an extra dollar per word of the uh, add-on. Okay, and then uh, you got to still working on it. You got to charge you know. for the shipping too, oh, shipping oh, and oh, handling. Of course, the shipping's not included. <laughs> what kind of day and age do you think we're living in? <laughs> well, anyways, Ashley, I felt like she just enjoyed your segment because you're funny and and kind and sweet. Nobody gets to see you, so they don't know. They don't know if you're just a torso. You know, there are people that are just torsos. There's I, not a I, lot of I mean, they have seen me. Don't you remember last Halloween? Oh. I, I am just... You're blowing our cover. Well... Or in this case, a sheet. I mean, look, I, all I'm saying is... No one can prove that I actually exist. <laughs> That's true. Well, I anyways... Mean, hey, for all we know, I could be one of those AI model things. That now, listen, I had Ashley talk to you uh, and ask you because I just thought it'd be funny. And uh, have you guys stayed in touch? Uh, kind of, yeah. Well, you, what do you, you talk about? You guys actually text each other? Uh, yeah, kind of. Not much, though, huh? Uh, I mean, not really. The, the problem with me and texting mm. is if I can't think of a topic to discuss, yeah. I won't. So you just ghost? I don't ghost, I think. It's more along the lines of I'm not just going to spout random words out into the proverbial ether just to keep a conversation going. Wyatt, every sinking time we do our podcast and banter, you spout words into the ether to try to keep a conversation going. That happens to be your specialty. Are you kidding me? That's all you do all night long, and now somebody's going to pay you for it, and you're dropping the ball. Wyatt, for... haven't decided on a payment yet. Well, anyways, here's but a... anyway, it's different though. It, it's different to be in a podcast compared to having an actual conversation with someone. Amen. In a podcast, you're the entertainment. Well, thank you. Well, well, I appreciate that, I'm... Jesse Wilhelm. Happy early Thanksgiving, all. Jason David Roth. God bless. Uh, let's see, Karen and. Nick are having a mutual appreciation society. Kerry Tudor, happy Thanksgiving, Brad White, and everyone. Uh, Michelle Burleson, hello from Ennis, Texas. Hello, Diane Neal, hello from Wisconsin. Love you, Brad and White. Love you too, Diane. Paula Faye Marie Rauchy, she's my famous and most favorite forenamed lady in real time. Louis Luian, Merry Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, let's see. Ashley Hess, another Lowe's story. Oh, look, Ashley showed up. Why the boy? Why the? I'm thankful for Jesus, says Diane Neal. You're not the only one. Greg Smith, hey, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving from North Carolina. Nicholas M. Blake, hello from Florida. Uh, let's see. Um, Karen's been sick since last Thursday. She should have had people pray for her. Glenn Edward Dios, rock on. Uh, let's see. Louis Leon says he's thankful for the Brad Science Show. Can you blame him? I hope everyone's had a great Thanksgiving. That's Nicholas Blake. Um, let's see. Uh, Karen Boyd, I'm always thankful for Brad and White in this show, and all of you who are all like mine, grateful for you. Yes. Forrest Beatty's here. Forrest has the what? Best name, of? I think. Of people named Four Spanish. Thank you. Uh, he said, glad you're... Fi- no, that was him. Hi, Brad and White. Enjoyed Rebel with a Cause. Yes, it's without a curse, but thanks, Force. Uh, Michael Quackenbush, would you consider worry? Uh, let's see. Goat, says Danny Heron. Maybe that's for Danish. Uh, let's see. Karen Boyd. Yes, it was great. Yak was so much funnier than Ox. Uh, thank you, Louise. Howdy. Great. Glad you're feeling better, Karen. Uh, James Voigt wrote Christmas Cards. Uh, Nicholas and Blake says hi to us. Uh, let's see. Plenty of flowers says I need your dress to send one to everybody. Um, Karen's now saying, Ashley, you haven't got one's autograph yet. So Karen's starting to play the matchmaker. And Stephanie like Williams says, aw. And guess so that's what? That's it? That's the entire comment? Aw? Well, you know what it is, Wyatt? I don't know if you understand this. Folks, here's the thing. My son is a wonderful young man, but, uh, when it comes to the ladies, he's got no game. So I decided I'm going to oh, make... Oh, okay, okay, my friend. 
Let us get one thing clear. It is not for lack of trying. Oh, well, that's even more pathetic, son. You should have no. kept that to yourself. You don't want to let him know that your game failed. You okay. want to say, ah, uh, okay. okay. I'm so, look. here's what you okay. say. Look. Look. I'm so busy with look. my studies. No. Uh, I've been working at, at, I've been working at the Peace Corps <laughs> for you. Just twice. don't have time for a serious relationship okay. right now as I'm oh, working my. on my doctoral. Uh, Come I, on, this, Wyatt. Look, look, okay. If you want, I could tell the story of the last time I tried. Yeah. Because I think it actually... Yeah, no, it, no, you're right, it's pathetic. Which makes it perfect for a podcast. Why, are you gonna, you gonna tell us the story? Yeah, of course, Sam, yeah, of course. So, <laughs> okay, folks, this is my son striking out at trying to get a date. Go ahead. You know, the funny thing is yeah. that, uh, that exact analogy, striking out, is very fitting for the story. Tell me. Okay, so... It's high school. I think junior year. Mm. I've decided I don't want to be a crippling introvert who never does anything outside of school. Good for you. I want to join a sport. Good. But you see, here's the problem. Mm. I'm me. Yeah. And as you know, yes. that and sports don't exactly mm. mix. No. But I, had a a friend, but I had a friend. Yeah. Who was in a sport? Yes. He said you should try out because we could use you. Okay. So, I took lessons. I spent a few weeks, one day, one day a week, learning, and then then I try out, and th it's this huge event, it's a massive, massive venue, lots of like. It's not just us, by the way. It's a bunch of different people from a bunch of different uh, schools. Okay. And it's just tryouts. Like, you know, just do your thing. Yeah. Do as good as you can. Mm. And at the end of, like, two weeks afterwards, we will tell you if you're good enough. Okay. So I, I, I do it. I, I, I do everything I learned. Mm. Every single skill mm. I had acquired in, like, three weeks of barely practicing. Okay. <laughs> and so I make it. I do it, and then I wait. And it's like the, the actual longest, like, week and a half wait of my life. Mm. Because I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't. Thankfully, nobody else did. Yeah. But still, mm. that doesn't mean I'm going to make it in. So, a week and a half passes, and I go and check. I, I scroll down the list of people who made it, looking for my name. And what do you know it? There I am. Ink on paper, I'm officially a part of the bowling team. <laughs> well, congratulations, son. I mean, you don't want to just be a dork. You don't want to just be a nerd. You said, no, anybody can be nerd. Anybody can do dork. I'm taking it to the next level. I don't want anybody to even have a second thought that when they look at me, they're seeing somebody who sh whose pants shouldn't actually reach the top of his shoes. I want somebody who th assumes I'm in chemistry uh, of club. And yet, why you're a great drummer, which is very cool. So you had oh, that, yeah, but... you had that, that ace up your sleeve that nobody could deal with. But, but okay, but, 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 but how, here's the actual part of where, where the, uh, Strikeout happened. Oh. So, I'm, uh, I'm on the league. I'm yeah. officially a, a bowler, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, and so we have our first few games. And immediately I find out that I am average. Yeah. I'll put it lightly. I am average. Yeah. Um, the only good people on our team is my friend who recommended me and this, uh, this other kid. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I should say his real name. I don't really know if it matters, but I also, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. In this day and age, dude. So I'm just going to call him John. Okay. Now, John... Are you talking about Brian? Uh, but Brian's the friend who uh, introduced me to it, yes. Okay, okay. But the other kid, I'm just going to name John. Okay. So John here had a very interesting bowling technique. Yeah. So when you think of bowling, how do you think it's played? Like, what do you think is the ideal technique for rolling a ball. You walk lane. up, you swing it back, you cut it. If you're good, you throw wow. it, so a little hook Absolutely on it. Absolutely wrong. Mm. You see, what, what John would do, he'd pick up his ball, 
both hands. He'd look at the pins. Mm. And then he'd chuck it. It would, it would land about like a third of the way through the lane. And the kid had like a 170 average. Was he the one that threw with two hands? Yes. Yes, I remember that guy. Was and so apparently, weird. I found this out after the fact, huh? that's just how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> Somehow. Why, I don't know if you're aware of this, but as I was just minding my own business having this wonderful conversation, <laughs> um, there's been a, a nationally hot sighting, and they're talking about you. Uh, Ashley said, "Poor Wyatt." So she's she's trying to uh, you know she's trying to suck up and make you feel good. And then Carlin Boyd says, "Ashley, you haven't gotten Wyatt's autograph yet." And uh, and then Diane I'm Neal says, "Wyatt." It. And then Diane says, "Wyatt is such a teenager, but I do love him." And that's when she <laughs> said, "Aw." And then uh, Jimmy Bledsoe said, "Wyatt's learning, Brad. Love your show. Enjoy happy things." So I'm thinking that's nice. And then Ashley comes back and says, "Carlin Boyd, not yet. She hasn't got her autograph yet." So then, I'm guess open. what happened? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, what I'm happened? looking for the other. Uh, for Spain, he says, Ashley wants a full cutout of Wyatt. Uh -huh. And then, um, guess what else happened? What happened? Oh, uh, I, go, I want to find out how this. You're the flow of the story. I, Ashley Haas says, have. And then. Uh, I'm rooting for you guys. Karen Boy says, I'm ah. Okay. I'm rooting for you guys. Uh -huh. And then Diane Neal says, seriously, how old is Wyatt? <laughs> and then <laughs> Justin Gill says, "Why you need a great wingman. Dad might not be him. Yeah. And then Karen Boyd says, around mid-20s. Don't remember exactly. And Ashley Haas says, Diane Neal, 27, which is accurate. Yes, yes, it is. How does Diane Neal... Or Ashley, oh, 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 Ashley, oh, that's Ashley says toys, so she knows. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, can I continue with the story now? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, finish the story. Okay, so we're touring through like exactly two different uh, bowling lanes. Okay. Um, there's one in Franklin, and then there's one in a place whose name I have erased from my memory. Okay. Uh, and one of the other teams, yeah, uh, school teams, there was this girl. Yeah. Who um, would uh, come by our table when like, she wasn't bowling? Because mm -hmm. she was about. I, I forget how good she was, but I, I would assume if she was hanging out with us, she was probably not the ace okay. on that team. That's just saying. Just okay. saying. No offense, me yeah. needed, but yeah. probably delivered. Uh, and so we just get to talking. And, like, uh, you know, she's about my age. She seems, she seems interesting. Yeah. And this goes on for a few months okay and towards the end of the season it's very obvious to my friends that you know i like her okay and eventually brian as you mentioned is like dude just just ask her out like seriously <laughs> and i'm like oh i don't know i mean we're in two different worlds yes i'm not even sure if we'd make it Right. Out there, right? In such a judging world, right. I, I was really into Shakespeare at the time. Right. So, you didn't notice. so, so, um, eventually, Brian gets like a pretty nasty split with his first role. Yeah. Like I'm talking like the kind of thing that you're not likely gonna get. Yeah. And my and he gets his ball for the second attempt, looks at me and goes, "If I make this." You're asking her out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like a slow motion movie, I just watch as that ball fl flies across the lane, hits the pin at just the perfect angle to nail the entire split. Mm. And so I'm just like, oh, shoot, I guess I got to do this now. So after <laughs> we were done with the game, our team wrapped up and everybody had headed home. But her team had like a meeting. I, th I think they lost the game, and so they're like, okay, guys, we've got to step it up. This right. is bowling. This is the big leagues right. or something like that. I don't forget the entire conversation. Right. So I'm just awkwardly standing like five feet away, just mm. like standing there, just staring at them. Okay. <laughs> and they, they don't pay me any mind, I think. It's also possible they thought I was insane and just not to bother me. Right. So eventually, after like 10 minutes of this awkward pep talk with me just sort of Idly standing in the sidelines, I ask her out. We exchange numbers. 
we talk for maybe like 10 minutes via text and that was the end of it. Why? I, the conversation went, like, it started out normal. And then by the time I'm like five minutes in, I'm asking mom and Macy, how do I respond to this message? And it was clear that even they were struggling. Mm. So it just didn't pan out. Okay. Unfortunately, I, I did. I did, though. Do pretty well in bowling. Hmm. I think my highest uh, score was a 210. Yeah, that's not bad. Well, listen, I, yeah. I'm proud of you, son. I mean, because, you know, I, I think you were, wasn't it varsity? Uh, was it, you were the varsity, right? I so you got that. like a letter. I mean, you're not even an athlete. And you like were two <laughs> no, years thanks. on the bowling team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two years. I was so literally in one of the pep rallies where they had all the sports teams come out. I know. It was embarrassing. I was there. Well, listen, I got to tell you something. I, I'm so proud of your bowling acumen. And, and I'm, I'm shocked you didn't keep it up because I always felt like that was your that was your gift. And probably if you had a shot at taking care of me in my old age, it was going to be because of your bowling skills look, but um look, i could have gone pro with all of that's what things. i'm saying but nevertheless i had to go pro i had to figure out a way to make money because you weren't and i knew that it was going to be up to me if i was going to survive and be able to feed you let alone myself so i got into other things and one of the things that i got into was acting now i don't know if you guys remember this or not but just a few weeks ago i had a whole different facial com composition do you remember what it was why you had the white Santa beard. Yeah, well, I did. It was a gray. It was gray, and I and I had a thick uh, Fu Manchu mustache. Matter of fact, do you have a picture of that, maybe? And if you don't, uh, I told you guys the reason I I made that I I I did that look, and people were commenting on it. Was uh, it was kind of uh, Easy Rider, Dennis Hopperish meets uh, Sam. Uh, Sam I, Elliott. I was, was going to say you looked like a hobo. Yes, or a hobo. One of those yeah. two, and a hobo that can't bowl. So uh, I... A um, no-bo hobo. A noble hobo. That's it. Uh, but here's the thing. I did it for this movie that I did. And in the movie, and I told you guys about it, there was somebody that I just had on uh, two or three weeks ago that I interviewed named John Schneider, who was one of the actors that was in the movie, and it's a movie called Jingle Smells White. Do you have a photo of me and John on yes, the movie set? Can you show them? I do, but they're not labeled. Is he, was he the one in he's the He's the blonde-haired guy. Uh, was he the guy in the blue shirt or the black shirt? He's got more uh, blonde hair, and he doesn't, have, he doesn't have his arm around me. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that one. Yeah, should put him up. So that's okay. John Schneider. That's me and John. And that's me wearing my uh, look for the I, movie. I, I actually, could you just confirm that you do, in fact, see him? Yeah, because, that's him. That's oh, him. Okay, so it is showing up for the audience. It is indeed, unless the that audience is, is all blind. And then, we're, then we just mock because, them. Because, again, we had that weird issue last week. Right. Well, guess that. what? I, uh, there was another guy in this movie that's also well-known named Eric Roberts, who is the second highest uh, amount of movies to have been in on, on IMDb history he has been in the second most movies of any actor in history his name is eric roberts his his sister is julia roberts put him up if you would why this was another guy that was also in uh, i think it was uh, the dark knight returns anyways he's been around this guy has been around i remember seeing him in star 80 which was about a playmate playboy playmate that was murdered by her husband uh, her name was Dorothy Stratton, and it was out in 1980, I think. And so I remember seeing him in that movie. He's actually very good in it. But uh, so that's me, and that's what I look like. But it was for a movie, and the movie was is a movie that I have some special news for you. You can actually watch this thing. I cannot believe how they knocked this thing out. They did it in six days. They've edited it, and they have distribution, and it is going to be distributed live. You can watch it exclusively on rumble thanksgiving day so i'm going to show you just a clip of some of the little scenes that i did with ben davies who was another actor who i also interviewed here who was the lead why well, show him the clip of me and jingle smells which is going to be exclusively on rumble this thanksgiving and you can watch it if you want to have your family uh love you forever go ahead and show him some 
Hey, Nicky! Uncle Michael says you've been killing it on the job. He's not my uncle. So proud of my little man. And he is my little man. Nick, I got you this. Wow. Did you get this from the trash? Uh, it's like my sanitation senses are tingling. I got you something. Is that because I got you a hat? I guess that makes us little magic friends. Why do you always make it so weird? Why do you make things weird? Well, why I get paid for it. Okay. As well, opposed well, to just being a bowler. Look, look, look. They all you get who, paid for Who, after three it. months, finally got up the courage to ask a girl out. You started texting, and then it just disappeared. Now, I don't know if she just kind of disappeared from your life, or did you just got get panicked and said, I can't go forward. I don't no, know. No, no. Like, it was just such an awkward situation. Like, it was like... I, I honestly forget exactly what we were talking about because I just erased it from my memory. So did you kind of freak out like she's just so weird? I don't know if this is not somebody I Not weird. No, no, no. Not weird. I mean, it was almost like almost like she was going through like domestic issues. Oh. I don't know the exact thing though. So it was almost I, like... I, I, uh, I, that's what uh -oh. I can remember about it, but I do not know the specifics. Okay, now you're creeping me out, son. Yeah, I, that's why so I, she I, might have been reaching out for help and you left the poor girl I in... had the entire family console me on this. So if I'm wrong, you're all in on it. I had nothing to do with it. Okay, fine, but then again... Had you, you consulted on me, I would have hooked you up. Look how I got you and Ashley connected, and she's never even seen it. Oh, yet. yeah, trust me. I, I looked at it. You looked at it. The entire audience looked at it. Yeah. But yeah, seriously, why are you weird about this stuff? Because like you get paid to do that in movies. How much so, money have you made off of Loin Boy? Ah, I you're all the only I'm one saying, making any money in this I'm stinking saying. podcast for crying out loud. You <laughs> are the only I'm one saying. making money on the podcast. We've got to change that. If you want to help me, you can. We're getting to the end of the year, by the way. You can donate to my ministry, which is God's Comic Ministries, which allows me to go forth and do material live in churches, conservative groups all throughout this nation. It also allows me to continue to do this podcast, which is not cheap, and I don't get paid. But I don't care, because hey, I feel look, like I'm doing look, something listen, good for humanity. Listen, if you want to make money off this, mm. it's easy, simple. Yeah. You, you already have the framework set up. There's this one crucial thing that you are forgetting. Is? <clears throat> Loin boy t-shirt. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I, tell me it wouldn't sell. Well, it'll have to be just like a silhouette of you, though. We can't actually show you because that's our hook. I mean, honestly, nobody ever gets to I was see thinking you. of like a, like a cartoon caricature of me based Listen, on the name alone. Let me ask you a question. So you haven't had any contact with, with Ashley. So, you know, I'm not, I don't know. No, 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 no. We've talked. We, we, yeah, but I mean, you don't really know. So in a way, it could be a blind date. I don't like where this is going, but continue. I'm just saying. See, when you said I that, I, I see. This is what I'm picturing. But I, I, me. I wanted to see this though. Hmm. Continue. I didn't see that. Anyways, that's what I saw with the, with the with the rat a tat. But um, I was wondering. So maybe you and Ashley should have a blind date. I mean, is it really a blind date if we both have seen each other? Well, you haven't both seen each other. If one of us has seen the other, then isn't, she's the blind one. Isn't that more like a cyclops date? Yeah, it is. Poor girl, she's going to have to close one eye if she's been dating. It's a cyclops date. Let's hope that nobody doesn't show up. Well, listen, for all we know, Ashley's got a guy of her own. She's got her own man, and uh, she teaches piano, so maybe she's got a concert pianist uh, on, on, the, on the hook, mm -hmm. and she's just uh, stringing you along to get that, uh, I, that uh, uh, autograph so she can sell it on eBay. Wyatt, I just, Ashley's scamming you, son. But, but like, did, did you get the joke I made about yeah. the Cyclops and nobody? Oh, I loved it. Then, you, then why didn't you react to it? I said she was have to, going to have to close one of her eyes to date you. But, so I, I, I added to the Cyclopsian element. But you did get the joke, right? Yeah. Because like, I, I felt really proud about that one, and I just feel like you not acknowledging me is like sort of part of the reason why this whole thing isn't going to work out as well. You know? Why it's going to work out because I know Ashley. Okay, how about this? How about this? Yeah. Better question. Did anyone in our audience get the joke? <laughs> I don't think they did. I don't think anybody knows what's going on. I don't think anyone's read, uh, like, the, the, uh, the Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, anyone? <laughs> please, please tell me I'm not that old that... Like, so what was the joke? I guess I get it. 
so uh, the joke that in the Odyssey, um, at one point the uh, the main character whose name I forget, uh, it, it gets tri- shipwrecked uh, on an island of Cyclopses. Okay. And uh, one of the Cyclopses is the son of Poseidon. Oh. And he. So is, he was beside himself. Yeah. So in the cyclone. Quiet. I got the joke. I got the joke. Beside himself. I'm. 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 I'm more upset. I didn't think of it myself. Okay. So the cyclops ca- uh, captures him and puts him in his uh, his cave. He's gonna eat him. Yeah. And this the main character, who is again named I don't remember, mm. has to figure out a way to get out. Mm. So. Uh, what he does is the Cyclops asks him, what's your name? And he replies, nobody. And so the Cyclops is like, oh, I, that makes sense. I guess your name's nobody. And so when the giant is sleeping, he uh, heats up a giant wooden stake and stabs him in the eye. And then um, the, the reason why he, named, he said his name is nobody is because when the Cyclops is like calling to his brothers to help him, his brothers are like, what happened? And he's like, oh. Nobody stabbed me. Oh, well, okay. And then they all just go off to do whatever they were doing. So basically what I'm saying is 14th century humor, very similar to what we've got right now. Like, honestly, I could see Abbott and Casella doing that bit. Wyatt, I think I can see why you've been having such a hard time with the ladies. Yes. Holy crap, Wyatt. Uh, you're, you're telling me you don't rem- you don't know that? No, I don't know you, that. You've never heard, read The Odyssey? The Idiot? No, I never read I tried to read it. It was ridiculously difficult, so I, I didn't. It's I didn't. Like, it was like middle school reading for me. What are you talking about? No, anyways, you don't, I didn't read it. So, But I do have something interesting. Odysseus, that Mike, that's right. Odysseus is the main character. How can I forget? Okay. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I think that... Uh, Hey, look what Ashley just said. Ashley just said, Seriously. love is blind. Seriously? I, I, yeah. still, can't, I still can't believe. You, you know, next you're going to tell me you don't even remember the Romeo and Juliet movie they, they came out with that was set in, like, uh, Miami and everybody had guns. Oh. What was that? <laughs> Scarface. No, no, no. It was an actual Romeo and Juliet oh. movie. Like, like, line for line, it was the same movie, but it was set in modern-day Miami, and everybody was packing heat. Wyatt? Yep? What are you thankful for? <laughs> this wonderful time we get to have together with Loin Boy and Mr. I Don't Get Paid. Listen, we're pathetic, but guess what? Everybody just said they would buy a Loin Boy t-shirt, and... I told you they'd sell... <laughs> I know. So listen, I and, and they could, and, and they might, and that might be a way for us to continue to supplement the podcast and you know keep what? it uh, running on, if, not, not if just we, fumes. If we do, mm. I'll, I'll give you the, the, uh, my share of the first shirt we sell. No. Okay. Because, I mean, it's like the only good idea I've had so far. We got to get you something for it. Well, listen, I got to tell you something. For those of you who care about freedom and liberty and free speech, that's what we do on this, this show. Now, many people who have seen my comedy online, they think he's funny, I like him, I'm going to go see what he's up to when he does a podcast. And so I always thought that I must have some humor in the beginning, and I love to have humor, humor is important. But ultimately, I care about liberty and freedom and truth more so than humor. Humor is just sort of a delivery system to get to things that matter. I want to be able to speak freely on the internet and in public and private. I want to be able to have real conversations with people. If you believe in that, then you can become an American. Now, you might think, I already am. I'm a citizen of the United States. Well, citizens now no longer uh, many times love, respect, care about, and will die for this nation. Thus, they are citizens, but they're not Americans. They've been stripped of the title. If you do identify as American, you can join the mighty 10,000. That is the first 10,000 people that give $3 a month, $36 a Uh, a year to go on to bradstein.com sign up with your name your email i need your emails because i need to be able to contact you if something happens that i can no longer communicate i can get to you through email so this is a way for you to join the mighty 10,000 the militia of the mind the peasants revolt and see if we can fight back and care about freedom 
and liberty in America. I am thankful for this great nation. I don't worship it. I'm thankful for it. I am thankful for my son. He's a nice guy. He's kind. He's funny. Uh, and he's got his quirks and he's got his strengths. And he has clearly, as you just heard, his weaknesses. I'm grateful and thankful for a nation that gave more freedom, more liberty, more money, more equitable elements of access to equality than any nation in human history. Found a real solid middle class that never existed before. It was always the peasantry surviving basically day to day while the royalty got everything, the lion's share. And a middle class was born uh, that showed that everybody can have a, a, a car and a trip and a vacation and a fun time. America is dying. Fix it. Do something. Speak truth at all times. Never, ever, ever apologize for truth. Stand up for truth. Stand up for whatever necessary and be prepared to defend freedom by any means necessary. This is what it means to be an American. I love art, Wyatt. I love art. I always loved watching you when you played at the Nashville Predators halftime show for an NHL oh, team. And yeah, you, that was great. And you played, uh, uh, you played Rush's Spirit of, Radio. Spirit of Radio. And of course, you played Neil Peart's part the drums which is saying a lot yeah uh, we, all, we also had to cut the uh the song short and we had to coordinate how to end it despite never rehearsing it that's and right i'm to this day not sure how we managed it. well you did because you guys were good players it was school of rock wasn't it uh yeah yeah, yeah. It was school, of rock. school of rock so um this is really where we're at now folks uh I love artists. I've had many artists on. I have a really interesting artist that I got to uh, interview just recently that will be on in the next couple of weeks. Do you remember him, Wyatt? Who's you remember who I'm talking about? The um, player of music. Oh, um, I remember who you're yeah. talking Isn't about. Isn't he going to be an interesting guest for these folks? Yeah. Yes. He's got a... Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I got some great guys coming up here shortly as we move into December. Uh, if you are a church that wants to do a Christmas uh, party, you can reach me through Facebook and just PM me. Or if New Year's Eve, still don't have that booked. And um, also even uh, a Valentine's show for couples. So I'm just letting you guys know what's out there. But I wanted to let you know that the particular guest that we're having on tonight is unique. Uh, I've had on musicians, some wonderful vocalists. I've had on some wonderful uh, vocalists plus guitar players, songwriters like with Gary Chapman. Uh, and we've had lots of different folks uh, from lots of different uh, genres. Uh, we've had um, actors. We've had uh, comedians. We have had, let me think if I can come up with anything. Oh, sculptors who build the animatronic dinosaurs for the ark we've had some really interesting artists but this is the first time we will have ever had a internationally renowned portrait artist this guy did a sketch of me in 60 minutes that i don't know if any of you out there draw but i i don't know how to, it's you just you watch it and you go this is impossible and here's what's really interesting why i don't know if you know this they hold the, the pencil when they draw like this, like this. Wow. And this is how they draw it, so that they can see what they're doing. They, they don't have They can eyes? see above it. No, they're the Cyclops. What are they, Cyclops? And, and they were, it's, nobody stabbed them. And they did like this and like that, and they made in any ways. You guys, if, I, you, I, if, I, you, if you've had a, uh, if, you, if you pay attention, you've already seen the handiwork of this man's uh, sketch that was done. But we also showed you, I think, and maybe we, if we didn't, we'll show it uh, here in the interview, the time lapse of the man actually drawn it. And you can see it come to life. But this man has done huge portraits and painting portraits, right? Uh, huge commissions uh, of very, very well-known people. And some of his art has hung in very well-known galleries and very prestigious places here in the United States. He's from Russia originally. His name's Igor, because when you are from Russia, your name has to be Igor. Uh, but he was somebody I got to meet, got to meet his wife. 
He is an American citizen. He's proud of the United States and being an American. And he uh, wanted to just do his work as freely and openly as he could, like all artists. They just want to be left to their own devices and their own talents. And so why I really think that the people are going to enjoy and really be fascinated by the world of internationally known portrait artistry and just to hear this man's story, how they do what they do, how he got where he was, and how they accomplish the things they have. And we even have some photos of some of the things he's done so you can get a fa taste of his incredible talent. And uh, he's a believer. I would hope the audience is interested because it's so far our longest interview yet. It is a longer interview, so some of you might doze off and you'll have to pick it up tomorrow. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's worth it. I no, wanted look, to give him time, Wyatt. It was such an interesting... I love totally artists. Is. And for everybody who wants to stay, cheer, uh, to stay tuned until the end, see you next week. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and listen, uh, do we have any subscription uh, special uh, question I asked him? No, no. Okay. no. All right, well, uh, that's all right. Ended it, yeah. Well, listen, folks, enjoy this. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, too. You, I want you to have a great time. We will be back next week as we move into Christmas season the, the, uh, and uh, the Advent time. We're going to talk about our lives, our country, where we're going, what next year means, obviously huge with a, a presidential election. And I hope to do my most ambitious tour live throughout this nation next year and just really try to inspire you to laugh, but also to stand for truth and to boldly and unapologetically speak your faith. Jesus is God, folks. Sorry. It's the only one that's ever pulled it off in human history. Be proud of it. Stand for it. And if you don't believe it, hang on to the show and watch it enough. You will. You'll jump in. It's the reality of life. In the meantime, have a great time. Have a great, enjoyable evening and please continue to talk white and i watch as the interview is happening and we will engage now and again wyatt has some work to do with a young lady by the name of ashley but that's between him and his potential for letting it all crash and burn as we've seen that is his mo but maybe just this time he won't cyclops this one folks S should i sign a voting board i think? would hope you would and send it Kind of hard to get collect the on though, delivery though. that would show her who's boss folks enjoy this incredible interview with internationally renowned portrait artist living in america but from russia igor babilov so you know i never know who's going to show up to brad stein has issues and uh, i try to get people that I find interesting. I think you'll find them interesting. I find I try to find people that maybe is not typical that you'd see on any old podcast. But oftentimes I'm stuck with Wyatt. Nice to have you too. Yeah, my son, uh, as my producer, my sidekick, oftentimes that's my banter. I'm stuck with, with the, my lineage. Oh no, how do you ever survive? Like that sounds horrible. Why, it is horrible, but yet I love you. You exuded from my loins. I created you from whole cloth. So I'm, I appreciate you're there, especially because you're pushing buttons and nobody pushes buttons like you, son. I know for a fact you don't. No, I don't because I, don't, I have some, I just don't use them. Yeah, yeah, we literally got that for you specifically for you to press. I don't think I recall a single time you've actually done that. I'm paying you big money so you do all You're the pressing. You're paying me big money to do the job you said you'd do yourself. Well, listen, here's the deal. You're my son. You have to do what I say because, as you know, a son is like an indentured slave. Like? Yeah. Or is? <laughs> well, pretty much. But anyways, I wanted to talk to you about all the different people we've had on Brad Stein Has Issues. And we've had some really interesting. We've had a NBA Hall of Fame basketball player. We have had uh, Grammy Award winning musicians. We have had... Uh, uh, PhDs in philosophy and apologetics. We've had lots and lots of people, Wyatt, but we have a very special guest uh, today because it's definitely one of a kind. And what's unique about this particular guest is his particular genre of art is not something anybody can do. Um, ooh, start a podcast. No, anybody can do that. Oh, uh... I mean, I guess that is true. You are the star of this one. Yeah, I'm the star. But here's the thing. You don't have to have brains. 
to do this thing. Once again, I'm well aware you are in charge of this podcast. Or skill. You don't need skill. You know, just keep them coming. Keep them coming. This is all very accurate to our current situation. But let me tell you where you do need skill. And I don't even know if this is something that can be taught. And we'll find out. We'll ask. I, 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 I don't know what it is, but I got to say, man, pressing buttons is a hard job. Mm-hmm. Would you I consider yourself an artist? Uh, a button kind of sewer, more like. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, you can take your little buttons and you can manipulate them the best you can. But this particular uh, gentleman that's about to come on uh, this podcast, I'm very excited about because it's a realm of art that I couldn't even begin to uh, participate in. But more importantly, we have uh, some some photos. We have some um, even some time lapsed photography of this gentleman doing his art and doing it at levels uh, that puts him in a very unique category. So how he ended up on this podcast, why, I don't have a fog, how this guy succumbed. He had to, he must be on like some kind of court order. Uh, how much money is uh, currently in his uh, pocket that you have paid him to be I, on I don't have enough money to bring this man on, but he's here. Uh, this particular gentleman that I'm about to tell you is a world-renowned portrait and figurative artist, acad- Demen- academics. Let's pretend he's not keep, that. Keep, keep trying, keep trying. Scholar and author. He's the recipient, and this is a unique son, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, which is a very prestigious, uh, unique American award that very, very few people have. He was also knighted Chevalier. Again, I'm an American. I can't I, do any pronunciation we, we, we properly. We probably should have rehearsed this. Yeah, I think you're right. Knighted Chevalier of the Order of St. Anne. Uh, he's a distinguished fellow at Catholic University of America and received an honorary doctorate from Cumberland University. And he was deemed living master by his contemporary, he's, contemporaries. He has painted over 2,000 commissioned portraits, including presidents, prime ministers, Nobel Prize laureates, royalty, three popes for the Vatican, and numerous other important public and museum collections around the world. And his George Washington portrait hangs in Mount Vernon Museum. And we're going to talk about that because he did something unique with that uh, well, that no one else has ever done. Shoot, with, a, with credentials like that, we should have him push the buttons. Oh, you're absolutely right. In just a moment, he's going to. But right now, I'm going to push the button that brings him on. Folks, Enjoy this special treat. I can't believe we got this, gentlemen. Please welcome renowned American portrait and figurative artist, Igor Babalov. I'm sorry, but bring him on. Igor, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Babalov. Babalov. I knew I was going to panic at the end, <laughs> and I did. But by so little, close. It was, was so, so close. <laughs> it was so close. Listen, I had the pleasure of meeting you only, oh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe, for the first time, and uh, introduced by a mutual friend. And I was told, you know, this man is a portrait artist. I said, well, that's interesting. I don't know anybody that does portrait artist. And then I went to your studio, and I saw what you did. And I got to tell you something, it's, it's difficult to describe because everyone has seen p- paintings in their lifetime, everybody has watched, we always have images, caricatures and, and, and sketches and so forth, but what you do is almost a dying art, would you, would you agree there's some specific specialty you have that you talked to me about that you think is kind of not even taught anymore in uh, academia when it comes to the art. So could you give us a little bit of your background, but also what it is exactly you are doing that sets you apart from so many other artists uh, in the world? Uh, well, Brad, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for uh, inviting me. and uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here. And, you know. uh, and uh, um, well, speaking of uh, uh, portrait art, it's true that uh, these days uh, it's been a real confusion mm. for uh, a lot of people uh, what portrait art really is, because yeah. quite often people think of photographs, photography, yeah. when it comes to uh, portrait painting. Um, and uh, You mean they the, will use a photograph to reference when they're drawing, is that uh, what you mean? Well, uh, I'm talking right now about uh, uh, just the people, not artists, and uh, who hear what 
portrait or portrait art, they think of photography immediately. But the portrait painting or portrait drawing or what I do, uh, working from life in particular, and uh, you know it firsthand. Yeah. Uh, because you were, see that in a minute. you were one of my victims, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although it wasn't painful. <laughs> no, it was amazing. <laughs> so that's uh, that. That goes. Um, um, I always say it goes far beyond photography, because photograph captures just a second of a lifetime. And uh, in a portrait like this, especially the portrait done from life, and uh, where you, uh, uh, you, the, the person. Uh, who sits for me participates you participate and you uh, uh, you engage in that and uh, you actually uh, uh, you know how it happened and uh, uh, you you see my it's like I see your uh, uh, face uh, moves and uh, you know I can see I can even feel if you think of something good or something yeah. or whatever it's like it's it's all projected on your face and your expressions and uh, you probably can see me too yes. because you watching me you don't know really what's happening on right. that side of the easel but uh, uh, you you watch me and you also you 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 wonder what is he doing yeah. there? So it's a little disconcerting because I, because, because I make faces too. You do, yeah. <laughs> and, or, and, and once in a while, I would see you kind of smiling or almost admiring, almost like I was watching you st step back and go, "Oh, it, it's working. This is what I wanted." <laughs> no, but it's it's almost like yeah. you are watching the process as an observer as opposed to doing it. Does that make sense? Right, right, right. It's a, so the, the, the portrait is really like fine art portrait, like what I do is uh, it, it captures more than a second of a lifetime. It captures the whole, it does. It, like eternity almost, that the, the lifetime of the person. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's why I call my portraits uh, uh, legacy portraits. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something what the, one of the big differences between photography and uh, a portrait artist um, uh, who not copies photographs, but who works on life is that uh, uh, photography takes everything you wanted to take and you don't want to take. So the artist can select. It's, uh, what do you mean it takes what you don't want to take? You mean you're well, stuck with the image? Well, there's it. certain things. I mean, we, we don't like, we know that when we look at ourselves, you know, and when, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we like what we see in the mirror and then we have a photograph taken and then mm. we look at the photograph. It's like, mm, I don't really like it. It's yeah, like made right. me look uh, overweight yeah, or, or uh, look at the, you know, the, this wrinkle or look at this or look at that shadow. Like there's something you don't like or that angle of the head mm. or, or the, but hair, maybe, oh, my hair, like I should have done my hair, you yeah. know, like those kind of things. So the artist can fix all those things, mm. can take care of those things. Of course, for that, you need the experience of working from life. Yeah. Not from photographs, because when artists copy photographs, they they uh, stuck to that. They yeah. they can't. Uh, uh, they just becoming uh, basically the the slaves, so, so to speak, of photography, because they cannot work That's any other way. Yeah. Well, and I think what you're saying is, um, if I don't like a photo, I mean, of course, nowadays with uh, digital. You can look immediately. It used to be you had to go to the dark room and look at them and make choices and decisions then. But even with digital, you can look at it and go, mm, I don't like that. Try the next one. Try the next one. Try the next one. And it sounds like what you're telling me is one thing that makes it unique about what you do is it's an existential art because you're literally working in the moment. And if I want to change that moment, I can do it mm -hmm. with my manual interaction. And that's what's so interesting about drawing i didn't understand this oh and suddenly you did my mm -hmm. uh, portrait and it's disconcerting it, it just feels exposed and raw and almost vulnerable mm -hmm. and you said look at me and hit, put, get your face a certain way and i just kind of said don't talk i'm trying to find some and then I realized I had to kind of stare at your eyes because you're trying to see mine because that's the eyes of the wind of the soul, right? I'm mm -hmm. guessing. I don't mm -hmm. know if, you know, if that's how you kind of start creating a face is the eyes. I don't know. We'll ask. But it was uncomfortable. Like, I got to stare at somebody, which normally we don't do. You don't just stare at somebody in public. It's, makes, mm -hmm. it's awkward. Mm -hmm. It makes you, oh, I will look away. Mm -hmm. And I had to almost 
get comfortable with losing myself mm -hmm. and just being part of this real exactly. moment without having to make observations or commentary or 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 critique about it. Mm -hmm. I had to accept a human moment and be okay with it. And that vulnerability, I think, is what you maybe are talking about when you that you can capture in drawing that you're just not going to get with a two-dimensional photograph that's disconnected, it's right. mechanical, right. it's chemicals, it's not human. The human just pushed the button. Right, right. So tell me about, I, I had a photographer on once, um, uh, who's a very creative guy or whatever, but I said something to him, I'm going to ask you the same question. I can take a photograph, <clears throat> and he can take a photograph, and his will be better. Now, I don't draw, so it wouldn't even be a fair comparison. But for, there's a lot of people that can draw. Yeah. And you draw. But they would look at the two and go, something is here that I can't do. Now, is that because you see something we don't see? Or is it because you have a technical acumen that somebody else doesn't possess? Or is it a combination of both? Um, <clears throat> well, um uh, the whole idea of uh, fine art uh, portraiture is uh, to capture the image or to capture the person, let's say in this case, to capture the, uh, to capture the person uh, uh, and to create the uh, three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional surface, uh, which is totally opposite from photography. With uh, photograph, photograph takes everything with uh, uh, kind of the same feeling, quote unquote, so to speak, because camera does not have feelings, just takes everything, what you want it to take, yeah. what you don't want it to take, right? And uh, it's like, let's say, camera does not see the difference, let's say, the distance between the tip of your nose and your ear, although there is a distance, right? And you have to see that. Exactly. So the camera does not see it, and therefore it takes the tip of the nose and your ear with the same kind of sharpness. Mm. And uh, so one, one artist, they copy that photograph taken by camera and they copy what they see. So that's why lots of portraits, they all turn out to be kind of flat. Mm. It may look kind of like, like the person, but there's something is missing and they, they look flat because the artist copied that photograph. That's why um, even if you work from photographs, photographic references, you would have to use a lot of uh, experience of working from life, so you can adjust that photograph, so you can apply that knowledge, how, how you would do that if, you were, if that person set for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why the, um, uh, uh, the skill of working from life is very, very important, and you have to work on this constantly, all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a living thing. You have to work on this all the time. When you say sp working from life, though, does that only apply to human to human or a still life? A bowl of grapes Absolutely. and apples. Is that a similar concept, or oh, yeah. is it a disconnect oh, yeah. in a no, way because it's no. not a living? W when I say from life, I mean in direct communication with nature. It could be a person, it could be a human being, could be uh, your pet, could be your uh, living room, the interior, or could be a still life, uh, could be uh, painting in plain air, landscapes. It's uh, it's all working from life. Mm. So that's the work in the communication with nature. That's what's important, and that's what's missing, I think, today, because uh, of uh, the computers yeah. and uh, the even artists, even scientists. You know, they get more; they are more comfortable in working with uh, computer yeah. than uh, with nature. Although, right. you know, how can scientists work outside of nature? I'm talking about nature. It has to be same with the artist. And uh, traditionally, mm. but these days it's like the computers almost taking over everything, and uh, the artists rely on them too much. I remember when uh, uh, at the uh, unveiling of my portrait of uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth at the Vatican Splendors. Why do we have? Yeah, we have that one. Why can you put that up? So yeah, we have a photo of him with Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Right, his, yeah. right. So, so I remember when it was uh, the the uh, opening of the exhibition, Vatican Splendors, and uh, 
uh, we were there was a small group of uh, the friends of the Vatican, and uh, and I was uh, the only artist actually because it was the exhibition of the Renaissance artists, and obviously the old uh, yeah. deceased, right? <laughs> well, and uh, so I was. Uh, 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 I remember that uh, uh, the curator, when he stopped in front of uh, a Michelangelo's uh, uh, sculpture, and uh, and he was a scholar of uh, Michelangelo mm. in, in Vatican, and uh, he said he said I particularly I would like to to make a point about this what's going on today in the arts, and he said I wish that uh, the artists of today relied uh, uh, less on. Uh, or depended less on uh, uh, computers and cameras. Mm. And because we have God's given uh, talent in us, but we don't use it, they give it, they give it in to computers, to mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, like masters like Michelangelo and all the other great masters, especially period of Renaissance, because that's where the lots of good art came from, very, very strong art. And uh, uh, they did not have all those mm -hmm. gadgets. So they had to work on their own and uh, to perfect their own God's given uh, uh, yeah. abilities. And uh, I think we, something that uh, probably not just to artists, probably in any other field, people should uh, be very uh, careful about that as well. And uh, because we have so much in us, you know, and uh, we are the ones who created them. Right. There's <laughs> the computers and, the, well, and that, the, yeah. the cameras. That's the irony is that we're being overtaken by the very thing we created. But one of the things that I find interesting is, is not just who you've uh, painted, but <laughs> and normally we think of people that are sitting down like I did, and they're mm -hmm. sketching, and there you go. But, of course, you've painted historical figures, and one of the things that you showed me when we were in the studio uh, was Washington. Now, we've all seen Washington a million times, probably the same picture uh, on the dollar bill or whatever. But you told me a story, and I wanted to make sure we got that, because uh, I mentioned it when I brought you up, that your painting of Washington is in Mount Vernon, which is quite prestigious. I mean, that's his place. But you have a very interesting story about how you created and basically reimagined Washington and how we see him, and it was fascinating to me. So I'm going to let you tell the story as to how this even came about, but also specifically, how did you come up with the image for Washington? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, in the, we can also mention about I can also mention about uh, my painting of uh, Christopher Columbus. Oh, okay. And, uh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> Quit uh, all these Americans! <laughs> well, he was an American, he well, was Italian. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I believe why it has that image. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, it's a large uh, a portrait of Christopher Columbus, like multi-figure kind of a portrait. And, uh, uh, but uh, um, how uh, George Washington came about, that uh, uh, a friend of mine, very good friend, Michael Novak, mm. at the time he... and. Uh, um, he wrote a book about Washington called Washington is God. And uh, he also knew that uh, uh, I painted that uh, painting of Christopher Columbus. Yeah. He called it For God, God and Glory, and uh, which I created entirely for my imagination. And uh, uh, so uh, he knew my experience, that experience uh, personally in, uh, in uh, uh, creating these historic paintings. So, um, if you have Christopher there, Wyatt, put it up. If you find Christopher Columbus, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so one day I was, I remember visiting him at the American Enterprise Institute and uh, sitting in his office, and uh, 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 suddenly uh, Michael says, he says, uh, he spoke with a very, very soft voice and he said, We need new Washington. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, it was incredible. I mean, I said, what? You know, it's like, it's like I, I would love to paint Washington. Mm. I mean, one of the greatest uh, leaders in the history of humanity and uh, the first president of the United States. Why, why was he thinking we needed a new one, though? I mean, was there something that... Well, that's him... how he spoke. He was a scholar and okay. he was, you know, that was the way of his speaking, you know. Okay. So, of course, we knew we had uh, many portraits painted in Washington, the yeah. most uh, the famous one on the one dollar bill mm. by Gilbert Stewart. Uh, but uh, when I started to look and, uh, um, you know, he was a portrait like uh, like uh, more like uh, 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 like a British royalty almost. Mm. 
And uh, he wasn't really that, you know, he was very down to earth uh, man. And, uh, you know, as we know in the history, a lot of people know that he uh, uh, never accepted, for example, the offer to become a king mm. and a czar or whatever, you know. So, you know, so just leave me alone. He said, I yeah. just uh, want to go back to my Mount Vernon and... Uh, yeah. You and uh, and uh, yeah and then uh, just uh, make my whiskey and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, in fact and don't in, in fact don't call me president after my presidency even that mm. and he was very very humble and uh, so uh, so I was very excited about this project and uh, and uh, um, so I started to research uh, I wanted first of all I wanted to see the likeness, obviously, of Washington, because since, obviously, he's deceased and he wouldn't be able to see it for right. me. And, uh, and there'll uh, be no photographs. <laughs> right, so he, right, exactly. Cheap exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I put all the images of uh, portraits of uh, Washington were painted ever. And uh, when I put them all together and it looked like they were portraits of different people, all of them. In fact, if you look at uh, two portraits painted of him by uh, Gilbert Stewart. Even those portraits uh, look different one from another. It's like and different from people. life. Yeah, they were done from life, but you know, they just you know, they, yeah. they were not uh, couldn't. I guess they couldn't really capture that exact look of him, and uh, uh, and it's it's uh, it's understandable in those days. You know, the country was very very young, and uh, there were no art schools in America, so a lot of artists they would have to go to Europe and. Uh, England, for example, and, you know, to study, then they would come back and, uh, you know, and, uh, continue their work in America, but they studied in, in England, for example, or France. And uh, um, so I, uh, um, and then I'm, I came, I'm coming across this uh, 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 sculpture of him done by Jean-Antoine Adon, and I'm finding out that that was recognized as the most accurate likeness of him. So that kind of explained to me why Gilbert Stewart's portrait is more known than uh, Jean Antoine Odon's sculpture, although the sculpture is more accurate likeness. And uh, so. Uh, was it quite different than the painting? Uh, it was very different, yeah, very different. And, uh, and uh, so I started to research more deeper into that. And, uh, and uh, so I learned that story of how, how it all happened. They, um, at, uh, uh, in uh, Virginia, uh, the Virginia legislature, they were looking for, uh, to commission a, a, a sculpture, a statue of George Washington. And uh, um, so they were looking for a sculptor. And of course, there were, there were no sculptors in America in those days, so they were looking in Europe for someone. And uh, 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 Benjamin Franklin, of course, he was, uh, you know, the social butterfly. He, he, he was in France. Recommended, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, he recommended uh, the uh, Jean Antoine Adon, and he was a celebrated sculptor. And uh, he, he he did uh, sculptures, uh, bus usually, and uh, of very famous figures. And uh, uh, so he approached him and said, "Would you?" do a sculpture of our president, President Washington. He said, of course I would. He said, he said I would, would be delighted, would be honored. He said, uh, could you do it by looking at the painting of him? By, uh, I think it was Jean-Antoine Adon, or, uh, sorry, Gilby Stewart, or uh, uh, maybe it was uh, Rembrandt Peel, perhaps one of them. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, no, no, no. He said, you want me to sculpt your president? I have to meet him. So they arranged a trip, which is a long trip in those days, you know, to cross the ocean. They even had to come up with uh, life insurance and whatever for his family. Wow. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that was like very unheard of in those yeah. days. And uh, so he trial, he came to Mount Vernon and uh, he spent a couple of weeks with George Washington and he did a life mask of him. Mm. And a then cluster did, mask. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then he did a, a bust, a life bust. Of him, and which is in Mount Vernon now, and uh, and then he, based on that, he created the statue that we we know uh, today, and that, um, and then it was statue. That statue was recognized by everybody. Like it was like, like the best uh, likeness ever of him, and uh, uh, by all his friends and uh, and uh, the Lafayette and all of them, they all said that's that's George Washington, and George Washington when he saw. 
work the Jean Antoinette work like he, he he really he he saw that he said yeah he said it's I think it's an uh, it's uh, it will be important for for the, the next generations to know what I looked like so he approved it too it was uh, his skill and uh, so based on that and that recognized by the contemporaries and uh, by himself and by historians later as the best likeness the most accurate likeness of George Washington, I decided to use that sculpture as the reference for mm. my painting. So basically what I did, I turned the sculpture into a painting and, uh, yes, and, and uh, created... Well, and it's the closest thing to him sitting with you because it really was based on his actual features, right? Right, right. Luster. So right. without him being here, at least it was better than a painting because you literally got to see the dimensions. You got right. to see the nose right, and the right, ear and all right. the things that you said right. are pretty crucial. Did right. you take any liberties at all with your imagination or do you feel like it was about as close to what you saw as you could... Well, the, the well, I tried to get as close to what I, you know, to what I, uh, like, uh, you to could, the well, sculpture. I put that up and, so uh, they can see what the finished product was, so yeah. And uh, uh, there is one interesting moment I remember, uh, because I, uh, Michael uh, Novak was a very, very dear friend, and uh, since he was, uh, he wrote a book about Washington, and uh, and uh, I kind of, uh, I consider, always consider him as uh, one of my mentors. And uh, uh, so in this particular case, I would, uh, uh, I would ask him, like, what do you think? And, you know, and when, uh, and, uh, uh, when the work was al basically almost completed, and I sent it to him, sent him the preview, said, what do you think? And uh, he sends me the email back, and I, can, I could just, I was reading it, I could hear his voice uh, saying, don't you think that your Washington is a little bit too well shaved? Shaved. Shaved. Okay. <laughs> so, because he was he was a very down to earth man. Okay. I mean, he was he was a true leader. He 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 would be leading from the front, not from behind. You know, like mm. and uh, he was uh, he would face the bullets. He would uh, and in fact uh, bullets would uh, uh, miraculously miss him. Yeah, it's a known fact that yeah. he got his coats were like all full of bullet holes, right. but they would miss him. I mean, mirac miracle, right? And uh, uh, he he would uh, slept he would sleep right there at the uh, at the tent next to his soldiers, and uh, he didn't live in the palace or whatever he was you know just like all of them yeah. he was in in a, in a battle and uh, so it's so naturally you know i, I just added uh, yeah. a little bit of that uh, five o'clock shadow mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. on the painting so that was the moment the interesting moment i thought and then the painting was inducted into uh, mount vernon museum mm -hmm. home of george washington which is a great honor of course and uh, it's uh, probably uh, I consider one of one of the greatest owners that I've, I've had. And when did that go up? Uh, what what date was it when that was placed? It, into it the was it was inducted on the fourth of July. That was right. particular that yeah. day, on the fourth of July in two thousand nine. Mm. So if you see this photo, why did you were you able to pull that up? No. So that is literally the closest portrait representation of. The original first president, one of the original founding founders, George Washington, if you're a, an American, again, we've seen many photos, we've certainly seen the dollar bill, uh, and even some sculptures uh, in D.C., but uh, that would be uh, the closest to what he actually looked like in real life, uh, and, uh, and now you can also visit it in Mount Vernon where his work uh, is hanging. So that must have been quite a, like you said, an honor and a privilege to do that. So, uh, and I'm glad you did that. So we all can get a better uh, realistic view of a man who needed some flesh on him so we can take him out of mythology and greet him like we would a normal right. guy. So that's an excellent piece of information. Thank you so much. We have uh, Bob Costas, if you're familiar with sports, um, as well as uh, a President George W. Bush. Um, and uh, an actor, James Gandolfini, the late James Gandolfini. So we're just putting it now. The, the gentleman, you can go to his website and see the extensive amount of work that Igor has done. I'm just putting up a few so you guys can get a feel for what he's doing and just how amazing this stuff is, especially if you don't know how to draw, you're going to be completely befuddled. And if you do know how to draw, you're going to be befuddled because you're going to be able to sell, say that this is at a different 
category uh, than typically people can do. Well, can anybody draw? Well, uh, that's a, it's a good question because uh, if you look uh, in the history, not just art, but history of education, even uh, uh, like the school, like the typical school education, uh, it used to be a drawing, used to be a part of every education, of every school. And uh, uh, whether you like to draw or whether you uh, uh, plan to be an artist in the future or, you know, you would get the same assignment as everybody else. Uh, uh, so there would be 25 students, 25 pupils in class, and uh, they all would be given, like, let's say, a pair of sneakers to draw. Mm. And they would sit in front of that uh, that pair of sneakers and draw. Mm. And, uh, and uh, um, then, uh, let's say, like, even, uh, even here, um, I saw recently in the Van at the Vanderbilt uh, University Library, there was a, um, a professor at the turn of the century. His uh, name was uh, Good Pasture, and uh, he there were drawings, couple of drawings done by him, and I couldn't believe that you know they were very very good drawings, strong drawings of anatomy, the anatomic mm. draw, uh, drawings. And uh, so what he did uh, uh, at the time when he was teaching, he would. Uh, um, um, ask his students to look through the microscope and uh, then draw what they just saw in the microscope, mm. regardless of their uh, artistic abilities. Yeah. So the drawing was very, very important. Why it was important? Because it would always, it would, it was known that it would develop you within, uh, in uh, regardless of uh, who you are, if you're an artist or not, it would always be uh, uh, helpful because. Uh, through drawing, you can actually start seeing things, not just looking at things. And this is something like I remember recently, I was uh, telling my students at the uh, Catholic University of America, I was teaching class to uh, uh, um, business students. It was a business class, business school. And uh, I was teaching them how to see instead of look. Yeah. Because majority of us, uh, majority of people, they like we look at things like we look at that at the sky we look at the car we look at the house uh, but uh, we don't really see it we just acknowledge that that is a car and that is the house and that is the sky and uh, and and this is it but uh, when you draw you actually start thinking about this so you start looking not just looking but you start seeing that what mm. you what do you look at and uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, reading a book versus uh, searching for the answer in yeah. Google on, on Google. It's like you find that answer within seconds, and uh, 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 three minutes later you forget about it. Yeah. But if you draw, if you if you if you read the book, it files, it files up in your in your computer up here in your head. Yeah. So so and it stays there forever. Yeah. So that's it's the same with drawing. So everybody can draw if they know how how because there's it's a real science. It's more than just uh, the ability uh, like to have a talent, drawing talent. Of course, it helps, but in general, it's like it's uh, drawing was always uh, used to be looked at as a, a science. Mm. That's why the old academy so far they were called the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and then. In the, uh, uh, some halfway through last century, that uh, was kind of uh, uh, disconnected. You know, the science part from fine arts. Mm. It's like the students uh, 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 used to learn the anatomy, and uh, before they would draw the human human figure. In the 1950s, around that time, they stopped doing that. So they 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 kept the f uh, the anatomy classes in the medical school but they took it completely out of fine art courses. Mm. So the students continued to draw people, a human, but they had no clue what was underneath the skin. So that's why, and then when the photography came, became so popular, that's totally, it's like, you know, it's like, why do I need to go to school if I just, if I can just copy a photograph? But then when they copy photograph, they have to, all they uh, uh, rely on is what the camera gives them, and that's there is no distance between yeah. uh, the tip of a nose and the ear, yeah. right? And they copy that. Well, I'm so I'll show you my uh, little foray into uh, drawing, and it's embarrassing because you know I'm with a master of it, so in no way can I draw. 
But I did notice and, and have a sense that it was important to at least see an experiment because I felt like as an artist in general, the more robust my view of how to see things as a comic, it's just helpful to have a more deeper analysis of what I would see. Okay, so I heard about a book, and you'll probably laugh because you're, you know, Michelangelo, and this is probably a comic book style, but I heard about a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Have you ever heard of that book? I heard about it, yeah. Okay, okay. So I heard about it, and it said it can teach people how to draw. Now, I, be honest, I wasn't even interested in drawing, but I think I wasn't interested because I couldn't. So it's kind of like I'm going, this is so terrible. I don't, why would I want to? I, I assumed you either could draw or you couldn't. You could either just do it or you couldn't. So the one thing this book taught you was this. It took a photo and it cropped it. So it was just kind of you didn't get the outline of their face. And it was upside down. And you're like going, who is that? And you're like, I don't know. All right. You turn around, it was John F. Kennedy. And then it took um, a sketch drawing of Picasso of a doctor, and it was just kind of a line drawing of it. And it turned it upside down and said, now try to draw it first as you see it. And that's where you, as the unprofessional, you kind of draw it as though you see it, as though there's a category. A face looks like this, an ear looks like this, like a child would do. Just a round face and a smile. There, I made a face. And you're kind of stuck there. When she turned it upside down, so it no longer looked like the categories it just looked like lines I was forced to just kind of just try to trace so to speak this line you turn it back around oh it's pretty close so all she was trying to say was this and I want to let get your comments on this what an artist does is they don't just look at a face and see the face they are able to to move into the side of their brain that sees the abstractions of an image. So they no longer see a nose, they see a little bit of a glint of light. I see a little shade right there. I see a little crevice right there. And, it, and it's almost like your mind turns it into a composite of, of grids of images that doesn't even look like a face anymore. Like your mind sees something that is no longer the easy go-to when we look, if I look at you and I just see Igor, I don't sit and analyze it unless I was drawing. Then I have to turn you into something else. So I, draw, I did some drawings and I, and I gave the date and of a shoe or whatever. It's horrible. I did her little tr trick, her technique. I did it a week later and I did these things. Igor, I looked at it and I go, Wow. <laughs> How did I do that? I couldn't. And here's the last story. Then I want to get your commentary, which is much more important than mine. But I wanted to give you an example of what it, of, of, of what it means to see something differently. Because you talked about seeing things differently. It's mm -hmm. more than just angles or distances. You have to see things in, mm -hmm. a, in a, almost a surreal way, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started doing an acorn. And I was doing it and doing it and doing it. And I started going, this is terrible. I'm, I'm, I quit. I got angry. I lost. 20 minutes later, I walked back to pick it up, and I go, I saw it. It's like, that's good. I literally mm -hmm. couldn't see what I was drawing mm -hmm. at the time I was seeing it because I had turned it into this, categorizing it as, as shadows and, and forms. Anyways, long story to say. Now, I never pursued it and moved on, but it proved to me that an artist has to look at things differently than the way we look at things on a day-to-day -day basis. So, A, does any of that make sense to you? And B, can you describe what place you have to take your mind to be able to see what you see when you start creating a portrait? Um, well, I think it all comes to education. And uh, uh, why I'm saying this, because when you told me the story and I thought again of my uh, just very recent experience uh, with uh, teaching that that business uh, class uh, uh, at the Catholic University, and uh, so when I had the students, I had about uh, fifteen students, fifteen twenty students, and uh, and uh, so I told them like what we're going to do. And at first they couldn't really 
understand like how like what uh, what does business and money have to do with art mm. you know and uh, and they were um uh some of them they were like I asked them actually I asked them how many of you held a, a, a pencil drew anything yeah in your life you know <laughs> and uh, maybe like two hands went yeah. up because <laughs> it's so, not typical for right, people to do that e exactly right? exactly so after and it was only it was a not a long course it was about two weeks course and uh, at the end of the second week they all drew believe it or not they all drew and they were the the um, reaction to their own drawings was exactly the same what you just described they couldn't believe that they could do it. Because so, what is your technique, though, when you teach? Well, it's a uh, well. Um, it is. It's not really my technique. It's uh, uh, it's uh, the traditional, uh, uh, classical approach in drawing, in drawing, or uh, well, in drawing. Uh, um, so, uh, when I mentioned uh, uh, the science drawing as science, it uh, includes uh, uh, such. Uh, 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 scientific subjects la uh, as a uh, uh, perspective, as uh, uh, studying the the form, uh, the shading. You know, shading. You mentioned about this when when I worked on your portrait, and uh, um, uh, the tonal values, the light versus dark. All this is in order to create that three dimensional appearance yeah. of the head. So it's like my my professor. I remember used to say that you you draw the tip of a nose, think of the back of the head. So it's like you constantly think of that of that of the form, of the volume of that what you draw. So that and of course lots of uh, practice that uh, contributes to your ability to uh, create that the first impression. What the impression you mentioned about. That what you see immediately, like first you see, like you, you. Uh, uh, it's like when you look at something, we it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, we don't really see that. Yeah. We have an impression of that. So to draw that first impression and then fill it up with the details, that's the key. That's the tricky part. And uh, because a lot of artists, let's say, when they draw from photographs, they start drawing one eye. That's how it works usually. They draw one eye and make a one perfect eye and then they look from a distance and it looks perfect eye and then they starting to attach the other eye to that eye and draw the other eye very very perfect eye and then they look from a distance and the, uh, both eyes they look in a different direction <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so they're crazy because, I, because, I made because, a lunatic because because they were attracted by those details and it's mm. not about details it's about the first impression is you have to so you have to see both eyes at the same time not the details both eyes the nose the mouth the whole thing the whole image because some everyone is different everyone is unique but are you saying though that part of the process is literally getting the distances like you're trying to almost in a crude way just delineate those spaces so you or 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 and then you go back and fill it in well, it's well. It's simply just to look and you trying to get the proportions right, because proportions, getting right proportions, is equal to getting likeness. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, students, like unexperienced students, they often do the measurements. You can see the students, you know, like with the, like some kind of measurements, you know, like and they apply them on the, on the paper. Uh, the experienced artist, you know, like uh, we don't measure like this; we just measure it with our eye, basically. All comes with experience, but uh, uh, the whole idea is again the important part is to think that it's a volume; it's not a flat image. It's not to get attracted by details, but to see the whole form, the large form, and then the detail. So it's uh, I don't know how it might be too complicated. Well, it, I, I only know based on my little experience with that book. Right. So I kind of understand because I've watched it happen to me, but I don't know that it's easy for people to understand. And what I think that that book was, I'm not touting the book. I'm just saying it. It's mm -hmm. it's well known, and it did. I actually saw results. But what it does try to help you understand is there is a different way of seeing and thinking when you go to draw and what she noticed when she was an artist that people they just know how to shift and they don't know they're doing it and i can give mm -hmm. you an example in my life i'm a comedian mm -hmm. so it's a different form i mm -hmm. paint with words 
mm-hmm. and uh, and I do um, because I use words and 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 I use meters and I use rhythms and I use vocal dynamics to use words to create humor. People have to see the picture I'm painting or mm-hmm. they're not going to laugh. Mm-hmm. They have to relate to it. They have right. to understand it. It has to make sense to them. There has to be a world that maybe they've experienced. It wouldn't be funny if I said, you know, I was in New Guinea and they have worms there that are very long. It's like, I don't even know. It, it, there's no comparison by which they can say vicariously, oh, I've seen things like that. Comedy always works when they go, I've thought of that. Oh, that happened to me mm-hmm. once. Mm-hmm. Oh, I heard of that. Mm-hmm. They need to feel like they're in community with this experience and then right. it makes sense to them. Right. So I noticed something. When I go to perform, um, I'm also an actor, so there's a, there's a similar concept in acting, which is what they try to say is you don't want to be in your head. That's the term they use. And that is when you're thinking about acting, you're terrible because it's flat, you're just speaking words, there's no emotive elements to it, there's no truth to it, you're just, it's a counterfeit. But if you allow the moment to be real, literally put yourself in the place of this is, I'm really here, I'm really hearing this line from this person for the first time, even though I know what's coming, but I have to be able to separate and almost be this neutral um, clay that allows itself to react based on the moment. And you have to put yourself in that position. Comedy is the same thing. Mm -hmm. When I decide to shift, and I don't know how I do it, I don't know how, I just do, into entertainment guy, where I'm going to deliver this information with this style and this sense of funny that I just know instinctively. I don't know why, I just do. It's a different way to think. It's like I, find, I can feel myself shift into something else. I'm thinking almost like I'm watching myself mm-hmm. perform. Right. Like it's, my soul is disconnected from my body. So I'm wondering if there is a similarity in the performing arts and all the arts, music. Absolutely. And drawing, that they're all interconnected. There's another place in our you mind know that God has given us, and it's got to be God. You know, I can tell you uh, uh, from my own story, from yeah. uh, how I started to draw. Well, let's actually. hear that, yeah. Uh, I grew up in a family of uh, uh, an artist and a musician. My father was an artist, and he was a musician, composer. So there was um, <coughs> the p- uh, piano uh, in our home, and uh, um, I was... I think about eight years old when I was I was eight years old when I uh, uh, decided to take uh, uh, piano lessons and uh, just following the steps mm. in, in, the, in the footsteps of my father and uh, uh, although he was a, an artist too mm. uh, the the visual artist but I went to music school first and in the piano you know it's like you, you start with one finger yeah like in right hand one finger then second finger then you know the whole the whole hand and gradually get the left hand involved. Mm. So the time came for me to left hand to involve my mm. left hand, and I broke it, riding a bike. Oh, yeah, I was a kid, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, so here I am, you know, with the cast, and uh, missed many, many lessons at the uh, music school, and uh, so, and uh, my father, uh, he actually had a great sense of humor. So one one day he says to me, he said, "Listen, he said, why why won't you go to the art school?" Because to draw, you need only one hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's, it, that's exactly, that's how it happened. That's, that's uh, and ever since then, I... I so you I didn't even know you could draw at that point? Uh, well, I like to draw, like every Okay, kid. so you I mean, had done I did, it. I did, I did, I did my uh, first portrait when I was four years old. Wow. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, you still have that? No, no, it was uh, actually, it turns out when I look back, it turns out to be commissioned portrait because uh, the, uh, my buddy in the daycare, he brought that photograph, a black and white photograph, I remember, of his father. And uh, he wanted me to draw it because he knew, he knew that I like to draw. So, uh, so I took, actually decided to do it in watercolor. <laughs> The most difficult medium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're four. I was, I was caution to the wind. I was very adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and the, so the man had a mustache. And when I was started to paint, everything was working well. And, and I kind of, for some reason, I left the mustache for, for dessert. And uh, so the time 
you know, like to do the mustache and then doing one very carefully on one side. It really worked well, then started the other one and it leaked all the way to the edge of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I should have, you know, being four years old, I found the, yeah. the, 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 the way to fix it immediately, the whole situation, and I just made the, another mustache to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first portion. Nice. But, but we exchanged, he gave, me, he, gave me, uh, he gave me a car, a toy car, so uh, like a little toy car, so that was uh, a fun memory. But then I started my art education at nine, so at nine, when I was nine. Years well, let's old. talk quickly about your your beginnings. You were in Russia, Soviet Union, I guess at that point at right. that time. That's right. what, what what time frame was that? Was that Cold War era? It was Cold War, yes. So tell us about growing up in a place that uh, freedom in in art. Now Russia has always been unique, or or maybe not so much, but in the Olympics, in um, art, in certain areas that they could use citizens to lift up the Soviet Union and how great it is and how communism is wonderful and Marxism must be and let look what it produces they've always leveraged their people's skills mm -hmm. uh, in that way and they've always been very very successful mm -hmm. so I wonder is part of that success a people who were so oppressed that this was one place they could be free to be good at something and feel an autonomy? Or did you always feel even there when you went to academy? Because don't they kind of sponsor you? You have to earn the right to go to a, to a place like that? The government has to get involved or is that something? No, no, well it was a very, very tough competition actually. And uh, because after the first school that I started at nine, at nine year, uh, eight, um, uh, years old, then I went to I was, I was there for four years, and then I went to another school, which was a, a, the only school in the country. Uh, it was specialized in fine arts, and uh, 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 it was called the School for, for Gifted Children, basically. And it was uh, um, um, uh, so popular that uh, 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 everybody wanted to be there. So we found... But uh, is it a government school or a private school? Uh, well... Everything was under, uh, under okay, the government. Okay, so it was controlled. Okay, that's Everything what I was, was under the government. Yeah. But at the time, it was under the uh, the Russian Academy of Arts or Soviet Academy of Arts, and uh, and uh, it was very very prestigious school to be in. And uh, um, but I tell you the story how I got uh, um, how I got in. Mm. Uh, my uh, um, so we're, uh, my father, he comes one day from from work, and he wor he he was uh, uh, he founded uh, the our in our town uh, the first uh, fine art school. So he was uh, uh, the um, the uh, assistant principal of uh, so him and the principal they founded the school. So he was assistant principal of the school, uh, and he brings this magazine. Uh, it's a national magazine. It's called Young Artist. And a very prestigious magazine, everybody knew about this. And he sees this, uh, um, the announcement that that's from that school, that uh, they are um, uh, announcing uh, 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 that basically that ex uh, accepting the students. And uh, he said, would you like to study there? I said, of course, uh, what, a, uh, what, a, what a dream, dream mm. would come through. And uh, uh, so he said, okay, so get ready and, you know, and start working and getting, you know, more works. And because you had to send your works first, and then if you accept it, if you get accepted, then, then you would have to do the exams. And then after the exams, if you accept it there, then you become, then you, then you, then accept into school. So okay, so we got all this. I got all these drawings and paintings, and uh, and uh, um, we were going to send them to the school. And my mom, she was a teacher, and uh, uh, that was a break time. It was a summertime break. She uh, was going to uh, a resort traveling through Moscow, so she said, why won't uh, I just take it uh, with me and take it to mm -hmm. school? So she brings this to school with her, and there is that lady sitting there, and, she's, and my mom said, you know, it's like I would, that's why I'm here, and my son's work. And the lady said, well, I'm so, and I hate to disappoint you, but uh, first of all, she said, it was the magazine made a mistake, and uh, they said, Nabor instead of Dobor. 
and nabor meaning they accept any oh. amount of students and dobor means only one person wow so big difference but sounds the same right yeah. to both words sound very very similar so 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 they had the dobor they need only one student but they announced that the national competition mm -hmm. so there are thousands of submissions and they sub they already selected 20 uh, for students, uh, 24 children to do the exams. And uh, so my mom, being a teacher, being a tough cookie, she wouldn't give up. You know, she said, may I see the works of the students, that were, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the children that were selected? So I said, yeah, go ahead, help, help yourself. So my mom looked at, uh, at uh, uh, all these drawings and paintings and just a few of them and she said, you know, she said, I think that my son's drawings, my son's works are uh, not any worse than this. And in fact, I think they're even better. So the lady said, okay, so why won't you leave them here and I'll show them to professors and then we'll let you know where, wherever you're staying if what they said, if, you, if he's accepted or not to do the exams. So, okay, so then we get the phone call from my mom from the resort and uh, she said that she heard from the school and she said that they accepted me as the 25th yeah. to do the exams. That's a big deal already, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm, and, and I mind you, I'm, I'm 13 years old. Mm. I'm only 13. So it's a big deal, you know, to go it's 24 hours by train from my hometown, uh, which was close to Siberia, to Moscow. And uh, so me and my father, you know, like we were going there and uh, it was very, very tough exams. So it was so tough that uh, the parents would not be allowed to went to the school. Mm. It's like so to prevent any possibility of cheating or yeah. whatever, you know. So we did uh, uh, six exam uh, uh, six exams. So two com uh, two drawings, two uh, uh, paintings, and two compositions uh, that and, uh, you created, or did they say I want you to do that? And they made everybody the same. Well, well, in the drawings and and drawings and paintings, uh, yes, and the compositions. There was one um, given theme. Uh, and the other one was like a free kind of like they just give you like uh, 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 let's say like uh, my theme was uh, like our theme was museum so they give like just about museum so anything your picture anything comes to mind you put it on but paper. from memory you didn't look at anything no from yeah. mem from okay. your imagination yeah. I would say not memory from imagination yeah. but you create something very realistic. So I remember that exam. When in the, the exams, I said to myself from the beginning, I said, I said, I'm not uh, uh, looking at anybody, not to uh, get intimidated or distracted. Or, or and I was 13 only. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I did all the went through all the exams without looking at anybody, anybody's work. And then the last, very last exam was like when we did that museum scene, uh, museum scene, uh, and uh, I looked at the. Uh, at the break time and they looked at the, the girls, boys and girls, they were, they, I was, I was blown away. They were so good. I mean, they were, they were like this. I remember this boy was doing this composition from imagination and you know, like something like a Jurassic Park scene, mm. you know, like a, like a natural history museum yeah. kind of thing uh, with the dinosaurs and all. I mean, it was so great. Mm. I said, I looked at it, oh, forget it. I said, well, forget <laughs> about it. <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> so I went, I went home. And uh, having fun with uh, my buddies there, you know, going to parks and ice cream, movies, whatever. Summertime. My father said to me, he said, how come I, I don't see you drawing anymore? I said, ah, I said, forget about yeah. it. He said, if you saw them, how talented they were. And then one day he comes, uh, and shortly after he comes from work, he said, you know what? I just called the school and said, uh, do you have any names like in the list, like accepted ones? Like he was very carefully kind of asked. So they said, well, he said that there is only one name, Babailov. I said, oh, okay. And then he said, I called back. He said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how it started. So I, was, wow. uh, so I still think it was a miracle because like I said, uh, I started in, in that school we used to we used to call them uh, my my classmates, the like children of talented parents, because a lot of them were, you know, like very their parents were very important. But when you society. saw these these images that these other uh, kids had drawn, um, and you were still chosen, 
Now, these are professional mm -hmm. artists or right. teachers, so they have to know what's right. better. They have to. Right. Their, their whole purpose is to make the right. best of the best. So they can see and differentiate the details, the minutia, the right. elements of the art that, again, the layman doesn't see because, because I don't know. I don't know how one moves from a master into just competent. There's m millions of human beings on this earth that can play piano ex exquisitely. Probably millions. Mm -hmm. And then there's a Mozart. And then there's a Rachmaninoff. And then there are people that somehow elevated to a place that we don't understand mm -hmm. as humans. Like, I don't know how you got to that l last stage. Now, if I'm not a, a music critic or sophisticated understander of music, I might listen to this guy play and that guy play. And they, oh, they're, they're both the same. Mm -hmm. But the true connoisseur would say, mm, that's music. And I remember once reading, uh, watching a, a, an um, author who had been given a letter. He had put a book out and he was given a letter by Dorothy... Um, is it Dorothy Sayers? Anyway, she was a famous uh, author in the 30s. She sent him a note, and he said, I loved your work. It was amazing. It was fantastic, blah, blah, blah. And he, there's a documentary about this guy. And he said to the camera, he said, you're not an artist. You're not a writer until a writer tells you you're a writer. And I thought to myself, yeah, I like that people laugh at my mm -hmm. comedy because I enjoy that. But when a comedian says you're funny... Because they know mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. hard it is and not right. everybody can do it. So what did you not see about your own work that they saw? Are you able to look at two different people and go, yeah, I'm That's better it. than them? How would you even know how to think like that? <laughs> because you were maybe going to be higher critique of our own work, yeah? Right, right. So Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question because, uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, um, they were. Uh, uh, so sometimes I think you know. I even said to 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 my to my brother not long ago because going back, I said it's, it must be a miracle, you know. <laughs> but uh, but then you know, say, oh come on, he said you know you had to be you, you know. <laughs> so obviously you know it's like it's uh, it's uh, um, uh, it's something like a, something something. Something happened. I don't know. It's like I can't even explain why. Why me? You know, because they, because they were so good again. But uh, it's uh, since it was as you mentioned because it was uh, it was selected by the, the by the by the yeah. artist by the professor. And they were very known artists too. So they saw something and kind of gave me some confidence at that yeah. time too. Because you know, mind you, again, I was just a kid. Yeah. I was 18 years old. You know, and uh, and uh, and then you know, it's like you know. The, the further it went, you know, and then I started to more kind of realize that what I have is a, it's, it's a gift from God. It's like, you know, very often we use, we hear this expression, right? Yeah. It's a gift, gifted. Yeah. So gift means gift from God. Yeah, we didn't so, earn it. So when it's exactly, so when, when it's gift from God, I, I'm never, I'm never taken because it's gift from, from God. I'm never, I'm never taking it for granted. Yeah. So I have to, I have to use, because God gave me that gift mm. in order to, to, praise to the beauty of that creation, of right. God's creation, right? But growing up in Russia, in the Soviet Union during the Cold War, very communist, very atheist. That's right, yes. Um, I didn't think that way. It's, it, it came later to me, okay. this kind of thinking, because of How course... How do they nurture an artist in an atheistic country? <clears throat> because I well, think art is transcendent. It well, has yeah. a greater, especially your type of art. It used to be in the Renaissance. It was always designed to uplift the human, to see God, to see something mm -hmm. grander mm -hmm. that would last forever. Postmodern art, modern art, has become very more base, very mm -hmm. more dark, almost counter beauty. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it deluded. This is why I think the, the view of the arts, let's say, in the, in the, in the, uh, at that time where I grew up was different than it is here, let's say, in the West, because it was kind of the meaning of uh, beauty was deleted with uh, a lot of relativism.
and uh, uh, the influence of modernism. It's like you mentioned earlier that you would look at uh, Picasso, they would let you look at Picasso's work and, you know, try to copy it in. And, but, you know, it's like, it's like in schools, in uh, Western schools, let's say the art, art, uh, art uh, uh, books, they would put uh, the Picasso and Michelangelo on the same page. And they call them both masters. So the poor student, totally confused, uh, this is the master and this one is the master. Who is the master? Who do I learn from? Because they're completely different. And uh, in uh, uh, the Soviet Union at the time, and I'm not promoting anything like that, that yeah. was better or war, whatever. You know? What I'm trying to say is the, the approach in education. That, uh, uh, and there are some schools here, very few schools, but not... Uh, not many, and unfortunately, some of them, like let's say they have, let's say they like the Florence Academy of Art in Florence was founded all by American artists because they, mm -hmm. they went to Florence to teach, founded that school, one of the great schools where I, where I taught too in 1999. But uh, uh, it's all the the education, the approach of education, and uh, I remember uh, uh, um, uh, my friend, uh, uh, my my late friend Michael Novak. Uh, uh, said once he was uh, he was a renowned theologian American theologian Michael Novak mm -hmm. and he said to me once he said uh, you know he said one good thing came out of the Iron Curtain uh, was uh, the uh, fine art education mm -hmm. because see in the they used because because of the Iron Curtain there was nothing all of this movements all the modernism abstract whatever it was kind of it was they were it, they were not allowed almost, so it was very strictly classical approach. There was um, so they were anti-modern. They were, they were. I mean, Why? it was kind of well. It was kind of a, uh, you know, like see, there's a pros and cons to everything, right? Because it's like uh, um, it's like it was underground kind of art almost, you know, the modernism and so. <clears throat> but uh, um, I think. For the good of the artist, the artist should study, and uh, the re uh, the um, the realistic, the classical approach before they go into other art. And uh, again, like I'm not, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not against any other movements and whatever. But I think for the in art education, just like it would be in uh, in music, for example. It's uh, to have a classical background, classical foundation is extremely, extremely important. I always compare it, the education, art education, to building a house. Mm. Like if you have a strong foundation, on that foundation you can build any house you want. Mm. Any shape, any form, you can build a, a, a little tipi or you can build a, a, a palace. Same with uh, the um, education in uh, the arts, for example. You can... If you have a f classical foundation, then you can go into different, all kinds of different movements and different styles. But if you know how to draw, I don't think you would go into abstract, frankly. Mm. It's, uh, unless it's like Picasso. In Picasso's case, he had a, 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 a classical education, but he went into something else because he just wanted to break the rules. But this is what <laughs> I'm curious about. Um, because oftentimes artists would say there are no rules. They consider that part of being an artist is we break the rules. We challenge the system. We're the ones that uh, open up the possibilities. And maybe in some ways that's true. I mean, artists are kind of mavericks, right? They're, they're outliers. They're not necessarily conformists, which I guess could be a good thing sometimes. But it seems to me, and you'll be a better... Mm. You'll be a better uh, person to comment on this than I would be. <laughs> it seems to me that the, the art world, the modern art world, is almost, honestly, a scam. Because there seems to be this self-appointed group of people who decide this is the new uh, hot artist. This is the new style. And they inflate the value of it based on what they decide arbitrarily, subjectively, is art. And then they demean the peasants who can't see what they see. When I taped that banana on the wall, what I see there 
is that life is rotting. And sometimes the classical approach actually keeps us from opening our eyes up to the beauty that is in destruction. And they just make crap up and people buy it. So it's almost like they create a commodity that really has no justification. Now here's the thing, does art have justification anyways? But, because if I don't have a piece of art in my home, I still need to eat and have a warm hot. I don't need a painting to survive. But any human being that is honest and looks at the Pieta or the Sistine Chapel and then looks at Cubism and says they're the same is either so stupid as to not be long in the human race or they're lying to themselves to create this false sense of depth that clearly isn't there when you see a masterpiece you literally go <sighs> explain why that has been lost in your profession the joy of being in awe at perfection at recreating the truth it's all about money right I guess <laughs> It's uh, you know uh, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's uh, I'm wondering how many people uh, think exactly the way you uh, just said. Because I don't like a, it. It's absolutely it's it's the absolute truth, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, um, you know when you think of the artist, so the, the the definition of artist. Artist is a profession given by God. Mm. So if it's given by God, it means it's to glorify yeah. to glorify the gods creation right so to be truthful to god so why to create some kind of s scandals why to break the form like picasso did he was breaking the form violently breaking the form it's uh, much easier to break than to build and uh, it's uh, you know when it, uh, speaking of pieta john paul ii called it the most perfect work of art ever created and Michelangelo was in his 20s, his early mid-20s when he did that. It's, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling. It's, uh, it's, something, it's something that, you know, it comes to skill in the end. And that's why, because it comes to a skill to do something like this, like Pieta, for mm -hmm. example, you have to go to school. Yeah. You have to study. It's like you, t you take the artists of those days, like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, you know, they had to, they studied, they went to the bottom on the... The, to the bottom of this, to learn the anatomy. Da Vinci you know, would to, open were, up corpses e exactly. so he could see the exactly. veins he and the tendons. He was risking his life. Yeah. He was risking his life in yeah. those days to do that. And uh, but today it's all given to us, right? Like we have everything. We have we have the art supplies, any any supplies we want. Just yes. just all you do. You don't all, have to grind all, your own. All, all you paints. have to do is to <laughs> have some money to yeah. to buy those art supplies, right? But it's all given to you. And uh, in those days, you know, like they were, the artists were making their own paints. They were, they had, they, they had, there was no electricity. They painted with under the candlelight. Yeah. And look at the paintings they created. Look at the work they have done. It's like today's artists, they would only dream about that. Ah. So what happened? So what is it? Are we, is it regression of our, of, uh, the humanity? What is it's going on? And uh, exactly like what you said, you know, there's, there's a group of people, you know, like the art critics or whoever, you know, like this, you know, some people who, they, they can't draw a stick man. Right. You know, it's like it's like when I say it's like you mentioned that you know that uh, uh, you know when someone in your profession you know like uh, he he praises your art and you know and recognize mm. it and that's the biggest award, right? And uh, in the, uh, uh, that's how I've, uh, lost my thought. Right? Well, was, it's all right because here's what I wanted to ask you though, to get your uh, professional insight. So one of the things that I noticed you mentioned, and, and when I was visiting your studio, you, you, you had a Dali that you, you said you're a fan of. He's a surrealist. Mm -hmm. that he'd be that mm -hmm. So would, so the impressionists would, would have been um, uh, uh, Van Gogh and uh, uh, Monet. Those were the impressionists, yes. Mm -hmm. And their concept was, well, what is the first impression that I get of this in sort of a, 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 almost like a dreamlike quality. Now, 
that was already moving away from classical art, perfection, recreating the, the, the actual reality. We're giving you an impression, almost a misty view of this thing. But I will say this, as much as I'm a classic and appreciate what you're saying and think it's crucial. You know, some of it I think is they're lazy anyways, or they're just not talented. So let's say, let's just make this well done. Since I can't do that, mm -hmm. let's just say that's not so important. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you something. I, I'm a fan of Van Gogh. When I see some of his work, if I see mm -hmm. Starry Night, if I see mm -hmm. Sunflowers, it does mm -hmm. cause me to pause and see some brilliance. Now, maybe it was just the color choices, but I have to be honest with myself and say, well, I'm not against that style because I think it did make me feel something, and I'm not trying to contrive that. So is there a place for abstract? Is there a place for surrealism that has value to the human experience in the arts? Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, when you mentioned uh, Salvador Dali, and uh, he is uh, 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 one of my f most favorite artists, you know, and uh, to the surprise of many when they ask, when I, when, uh, when I tell them that, because people usually think that I'm uh, a strictly realist, and, uh, but uh, I love Salvador Dali because uh, uh, he, is, he knew how to draw. He was a real master. He got a great skill of drawing. And uh, for some reason, they put him in the same kind of uh, uh, page with the abstract and, uh, and uh, all kinds of different... Uh, but it was modern, some very modern surreal right, but, images. But the thing is, when you, it's, it, it, it takes a skill to make that fork fly or make that clock uh, melt. In his in his paintings, so t he had to have that. He had to know how to do it, so it would so it would be convincing to a viewer. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not just splashes of paint. Mm. And he was a great drawer. And in fact, you know, like you would be surprised, and a lot of people surprised to hear that uh, uh, one of his idols uh, was Raphael, mm. Salvador Dali. Mm. Yeah, Raphael was one of his idols okay. because he could draw, and Dali he would tell artists, he, it's uh, one of his known uh, 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 statements, he, would say, he said, artists draw with exclamations. So important to draw, to know how to draw, but to draw realistically, of course. Because if you, again, if, like, if you have that classical background, then you can express anything you want. In, uh, uh, with regards to uh, 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 that my uh, own, like being an artist and uh, um, seeing uh, things artistically, like quote unquote, because uh, you know, being, being a portrait artist, you still have to, you still create. Is that what uh, keeps you moving forward? Yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes people ask me, you know, typical question: Are you happy? Mm. And I'm very confused what to say because if I say I'm happy, it will be I will be lying to myself because it's not like I'm not happy. It's just. I always see something that I wouldn't do in the next work. Yeah. Because if I say you mean to myself, happy with your with the result of a project, right, I right. See. But but you know, happy can be in, interpreted in different ways. Mm. So I always have to to me like I have I need that a little bit. I leave that little space, you know, to 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 improve. Mm. So it's uh, because if I say I'm happy, then I'm dead as an artist mm. because it's like you have to improve right. constantly. Is there any of your work that you're specifically particularly proud of? Anything that you, maybe not perfect, but at least said, I really am pleased with that particular result. Anything that stands out? Well, I have to say that when I look back at what I've done, I, wouldn't, I would not have done it any differently in a sense because everyone, every work requires that particular approach. Even if I paint portraits, because everyone is an, an individual, so the approach is different, very different. It's like you paint in, you wouldn't paint the same way uh, uh, an eight years old man as you would a uh, four years old uh, uh, little yeah. precious uh, child, right? right? It's a different approach. So it's a, it's a, uh, I'm uh, uh, satisfied with what 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 been done before, and uh, but you always kind of looking forward to something new, something you know, mm -hmm. something. And uh, 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 
it's a uh, uh, portrait portrait is something that i am known for because I, i've loved to do that all my life since i was a kid um i found it uh, why i loved to do it because i found it was the most challenging and uh, because we're talking about uh, working from life for example and uh, this is why it's like sometimes like i could use let's say um uh, the uh, uh, pictures as references for like let's say if i'm let's say if i'm doing a, a, a corporate portrait even family portrait but but i would use them only as references i would never copy mm-hmm. a single photograph and uh, what i usually do like i put 400 500 photographs together and look at them and down downsize them to let's say 100 and then i create a composite image out of those uh because again not a single photograph can can justify the person they always every photograph needs to be adjusted somehow so that's why i create these composite images but uh, the important part is that in order to do that you have to have that experience of working from life mm. and this is why in one of the particular ways is uh, um, is to um judge i think about the artist the, the qualification of an artist if the artist can draw from life mm-hmm. it's like i always say you know like ask the artist to draw from life if they can draw from life then then you you can but, you can you but can, are you, you saying can, that even in, in, in modern scenarios where somebody's in an art class isn't that still a a, a pretty standard uh, uh s- technique is is having a st- a uh, still life or even models in your practice isn't that kind of not, still not no? a, not a common i mean the people yes people do but you know if you look at uh, uh, today's uh, uh, schools many schools the students don't even learn how to hold a pencil mm-hmm. properly really very often i see it all the time actually 99% of time so I there's see a way to hold the pencil when absolutely, you draw absolutely absolutely like like when i drew you uh, uh well, we're going to show that by the yeah, way yes so so um, so uh, 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 if you can just just play, note note how i hold the pencil oh i noticed you have it kind of yeah. like upside down from it's not it's not upside down that's the right way to hold the pencil because that's what the, all the masters in the past that's how they held their pencils why is that uh because this way you control the pencil and uh, you can do it very something very light or you can apply a little more pressure you can make it darker with uh, uh the other way like the typical like drawing, kind of a yeah. can, can like, like writing like writing way it's uh, uh that way pencil controls you so whether you want it or not you're applying a lot of pressure on it wow and uh, uh so also the other way that uh, the traditional the classical way you can use the side of pencil Oh. Because this way you can use only the tip of a pencil. So, do you also paint like this? No, when brush? you paint, when you paint and you hold it like the normal, like this. You do, yes. okay. But when you draw, you have to hold the pencil that way. Why is it possible to put the entire uh, uh, image up, or can it only go sideways? Can you put the entire image up in front of us, of of the time lapse? Uh, yeah. Can you fill the whole? category it's last what about a minute it lasts about uh, 30 seconds is that right yeah so folks I'm gonna show you something and it has that music too yes <laughs> so I was setting uh, setting that's why I'm not an English stone uh, I was sitting in uh, Igor's studio and uh, by the way if you are interested in a commission to have a world-renowned classic artist do you or your grandfather or your chairman of the board or whatever you can commission him, and just to let you know, it ain't cheap. So this is real. This is this is the major leagues. So, but you will have something that's so magnificent, and probably quite valuable because you're dealing with someone who's done popes and presidents and so forth. So I had the privilege, just a comic with a silly podcast, to sit down and and he began to to draw me. Now I don't see it. You don't see it. You're a little. I mean, maybe we've sat in front of caricature artists at a theme park, but to know somebody's actually trying to draw your actual face, it's a little unnerving, you're a little, you feel, like I said, exposed and vulnerable because you feel like, maybe this is over the top, a a piece of your soul is being removed and placed somewhere. Now that seems crazy, but no, because a human is looking at a human real time. We're breathing, 
We're moving, our faces are changing, and we are recreating truth with the shades of truth. I know it sounds like I'm over the top, but it's, that's what's happening. I'm seeing on a piece of paper and simply on, on textures and shades and, 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 and maybe a harder pushing and pressing and a lighter. And out of that is similar, I guess, to what Michelangelo said when he sculpted. I'm not making David out of this marble. He's inside of there, and I'm just letting him out. And that has to be similar to a, to a, a, a magnificent portrait of ours. He's already here. I'm just letting him out so you can see him with us. So why have you, is it all ready to go? All right, so I'm going to show you him drawing this. Now keep in mind, as you're watching this, this is about an hour's worth of work. If, if he'd spent 10 hours, it would have been even more amazing. And it's still going to be better than any of us can do. I never saw this the whole time. So I'm, you're watching it being built. I didn't know what was going on. And yet here's what it looks like. So why go ahead and start that so they can see what it looks like to have a, uh, a master at his art actually uh, hold a pencil the wrong way so that he can make your portrait. Is it going? It's ridiculous. How does, how does he do that? Huh? That's crazy. Are you, have you gotten to, so, so, because it's so natural to you, it's a gift. I understand that. And I do believe in the term gift. People say, oh, I can't imagine doing stand-up comedy. He said, I don't know why I can do it, but I can. But if you see it as a gift, you don't take credit for it. You're grateful for it. You're appreciative of it, but you don't know how else to think. I just know how to do that. I don't know how else not to do this. So, so are you able to do your work and, and be moved by your own work? Or is it kind of like, I'm kind of used to this now. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can do it, but I'm not impressed by my own work. I don't know. Tell me. Well, where... well it's, uh, you know, I, 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 I tell you that it's... Uh... Um, I have to uh, psychologically prepare myself to when I work this, like just when I do this, uh, I I can even uh, do give a little exercise to my to my hands, and uh, just to feel so so nothing is in the way between me and my model, mm. and so nothing distracts me. And uh, the most important thing is, for example, is for uh, my model to be very comfortable mm. in the chair. For me, comfort is the sec it's a secondary. Uh, so because, in fact, you know, I will feel sleepy if I have a comfortable chair. Okay. Chair. Okay. So it's a, everything is about my work, uh, my uh, the my my that uh, what I have the pencil in my hand, the paper in front of me, and the model in that communication. So I know that I have only a very short period of time. For example, usually I'm trying to do it within. Uh, uh, 30 minutes if it comes to children, let's say, because they have a hard time sitting yeah. longer, you know, but uh, if I can do it longer, like within an hour, like this kind of sketch, it's, it, it's, so it's good. And uh, for a larger size, it may take an hour and a half, but uh, it's, uh, I know that I have very limited time, so I cannot even use uh, eraser that much, for example. So you really have to have a great concentration concentration there. And uh, so every stroke you put should be just in place where it should be. So for that, you have to think very, very intensely what you do first, what you do next. It's like the accidents don't happen in this kind of work. So you, uh, I get 
you know, sometimes what I do, like I look at the person because like at that time I just met you, right? Yeah. When we did that. And I looked at you and uh, try to see right away like what makes you different from anybody else. Mm. Or let's say if you had your twin brother mm. next to you, which I don't know, you don't have twin brother, right? <laughs> but let's say if you had twin brother mm. and what would make you different from mm. your twin brother? And uh, so make very, very something to find very something very unique. And uh, I'm keeping it in mind all the way until the until the end, until completion. So I do the I try to capture the most important things like uh, uh, I don't go too much into details, yet the details are there. And when you see the, the drawing. Well, I did notice, too, that when I would watch that sometimes your facial expression, of course, we're, we're there an hour. I mean, nobody's going to just be, you know, static. But sometimes I would notice you smiling a little bit. And I wondered in my mind, because I'm a skeptic, is he doing that to try to influence me to do something else? And at one point you even said, you didn't say it, but you said, like, I want to see a bit of a smile. And I remember Just thinking, touch, yeah. yeah, and I actually thought to myself, <laughs> I want to have like a Mona Lisa smile. It's kind of there, but it's not there. Let's see if he can find it. I literally was thinking, I want to have sort of in the middle. But I wondered, so when you are, do you, are you aware of your facial expressions? Do you ever use them I, to try to help influence, or is it just what's coming out of you I, as you're drinking? No, I, I'm not trying to influence my sitter, but I know that I do make faces mm. when, I, when I draw, and uh, people told me that before. It's probably because I'm, uh, it's almost mimicking mm. what I see yeah. or I, what, what I want to see. Yeah. And uh, because it's like almost, you know, when I draw your face or somebody else, and I'm trying to feel like if I'm that person mm. in order to get in order to get because the whole idea is not just to copy the facial likeness but kind of to um, you know to capture far beyond that because that's mm. what you know that's why we like the, well, that's the, what I meant about Lisa, you the soul though I feel like that's right. truly there well folks you saw what it looked like when he uh, drew me in that time-lapse photography and if I'm not mistaken, he brought um, something to as a, uh, a gift, I guess, or something uh, to me. It's not the original. Uh, he holds on to that as an artistic. He has that um, uh, a privilege to do with his original art as he should be. It's his, and it belongs to him. But if I'm not mistaken, you brought a representation. Why don't you explain to them what exactly this means? Well, when you it's, a, it's, it's, it's a print. It's a print of the original, and uh, I'm doing it just like as an appreciation mm. for, you know, uh, for meeting you. Well, and it's going to end up in our and, backdrop and, for and, on my podcast. Well, that's well, right. you mentioned that that you were planning to, you would, you would yeah. have loved to have it there. So yeah. that's why I decided to make that uh, uh, that print of mm. the original. So it, it looks just like original, but it's not original. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, um, it's uh, it, I'm sure it will be a great memory and uh, absolutely like to... please yes if you would so we set it right over here and uh, so he's going to give me for the first time uh, this print that I've never seen to this moment looks like it's framed it already. is uh, it is done on canvas on canvas because oh. canvas is much it would be much easier yes. to preserve. You wouldn't have to put it on the glass. Okay. And uh, so it will last for for, so can for, I, uh, for for hundreds of years. This is you can see. Uh, so is Igor, the Bal the Bailov, yes. or 1965 portrait of Brad Stein, print on canvas of the original sketch from life, on October 23rd, 2023. Well, folks, join me <laughs> as he presents me with. So here we go. <laughs> Wow! Igor Balayov, 2023, Brad Stein. Look at that. I mean, I'm looking at me, but I'm still <laughs> shocked and amazed. And like I said, if you just look in close, that's what's fascinating. All you see is shades of a pencil. And then yeah. you back up and a human being appears like this from is, ex nihilo. Yeah? This is that's right, and this is just a pencil, but uh, you know, quite often when I, uh, uh, because this is part of my um, uh, portrait procedure is uh, to make this kind of sketches, like let's say if I'm working on the official yeah. uh, uh, oil portrait, I do this kind of sketch, 
first. And uh, I've had even a few times people would tell me that, you know, if, if this stays as my official portrait, I will be fine. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so let me set it. Anyway, sit down so, here. So We're you know what right I now. say? I say that if you like this case, just wait until you get the portrait. Yeah. I'm going to put it just, for, just mm -hmm. to close up. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. It might end up over here. Who knows? Well, what's going to be somewhere here mm -hmm. for sure. God, thank you so much. What You're a, welcome, what a privilege and an honor to have to be in, in the same uh, category as popes and actors and musicians and, and so forth and so on. Well, listen, um, I'm so privileged not only to, to, to see this magnificent thing, you know, um, but I love artists. I'm an artist. I'm not like you, artist. I'm a different type. I'm a performing mm -hmm, artist, mm -hmm, different. Mm -hmm. But art... There's a lot of proofs of God in this earth, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not necessarily mathematically definable. That's how the atheist wants it. I want to see God in a test tube. I want to see him in a Petri dish. I want to see him open the sky and say, here I am. And, and God doesn't do that. Number one, he's not bow bound to our description of how he has to decide to himself but it appears that God reveals himself in abstract ways in mysterious ways sometimes in shadows sometimes in whispers sometimes in revelation uh, sometimes we have had experiences of individuals that said something happened that I cannot explain that was godlike but I do believe that art whether it's a drawing, whether it's comedy, whether it's music, whether it's jugglery, whether it's gymnastics. Uh, um, animals don't do that. Stars don't do that. Molecules don't do that. Only humans. Only humans give a gravity to humanity and that came from the judeo-christian idea that mm -hmm, we're made mm -hmm. in god's image that we're imagers of god that our existence is proof that there's something grander than this world and we're the only ones that have you know we think the earth is is big and that creation is beautiful and it is and that the universe is beyond our mind in, in its depth and it is but as i say in my show but the, there's one thing the universe universe has never done it has never taken a moment to contemplate me because it doesn't know it's here. Only we know there's something here that tells us there's something grander, uh, something greater, something more important than our existence, and that there is a supernatural forever mm -hmm. well, that we end up. You know, with, uh, uh, in relation to what I do, uh, doing portraits, it's, uh, I always keep in mind that uh, it's something very sacred, in a way, because uh, 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 the human being is the most perfect God's creation. Yeah. It was recognized as the most perfect God's creation. So I feel a huge responsibility mm. every time I work on uh, someone's portrait because I know that it will be uh, seen by generations of people yes. to come. Like, uh, let's say, uh, speaking of oil paint, if it's done in oil, uh, it's according to scientific research, it takes... 450 years for oil paint to dry completely. Wow! So imagine how long it will be from now. And it's so when I sub, sometimes I say it for to people, uh, you know, that it's not really for them that you know that mm. uh, that that kind of painting. It's uh, it's uh, they do it for their descendants, mm. for great 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 grandchildren. Mm. <clears throat> That's why one of the reasons I call it the legacy portrait. So it's uh, it's a uh, 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 um, a huge honor, I, I consider too, uh, uh, and uh, uh, again never took it for granted, yeah. for the same reason that it's uh, it's uh, uh, something been given to me, and uh, it's like if God gave me a brush in my hand, um, uh, why would I waste it on uh, uh, painting butterflies and uh, you know. It's like if I can make something like a statement. No, I've, uh, well, I mean, that's so like, beautiful. Like and, and, but, this is, but you are part of the classical <clears throat> Renaissance uh, time mm -hmm. frame mm -hmm. and prior to that. Mm -hmm. So as we get ready to wrap this up, Igor, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to ask you two more questions. <clears throat> One I'm going to ask you to answer um, in general, 
and the other one I'm going to have, have you answer to the audience. So the first one is this. You came from the Soviet Union. You came from a time that was very um, challenging uh, in, in, in the West and in the world in general. And, but I, what I would just simply ask you is this. Why does America matter? Land of opportunity. And, and exactly, oh, land yeah. of opportunity. And, uh, but also uh, the, the freedoms that, uh, that uh, we have here. And uh, I decided to paint that painting uh, which you saw in my studio, mm. a large painting, uh, I called it Mercy. It's uh, uh, dedicated to the uh, uh, suffering of the uh, innocent children of the world. Uh, so it shows uh, ch children of different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, and this, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Christians and uh, Muslims and the Jewish and you know and all kinds of and both the, bo uh, uh, the the Indian the the East Indian and uh, uh, like a lot of different nationalities as uh, and mostly it's children. There are some adults, but mostly children. And uh, it's uh, it. Uh, um, the reason I painted this, and it's a very large piece again, and the reason I painted it is just uh, wanted it to be a wake-up call for particularly for people here in uh, in North America and in uh, in uh, in the United States, and uh, uh, to wake up a little bit and to see what they've got here, because what they've got here, no other place on earth has that. So, and that painting is uh, it's very. It's a tragic painting. It shows it's not uh, a happy painting mm. because it shows the truth, what's going on in the world. And uh, uh, um, I just uh, and I just completed it. It took me many years to paint it because I painted it uh, not for commission and uh, just painted it from from my out of my own desire and from my heart. And uh, and it was done in between commission works because I'm busy with commission mm. portraits and. Uh, and so that that is a multi-figure painting which is created entirely from my imagination. I did not use any photographs or any, all the people for entirely. Has it from ever my been shown to the public? Not yet, not yet. And uh, so I, I don't know if that's something you would want us to to put in later, well, or we well, can we can oh, superimpose. Yeah, there is a, there is a, there is a little teaser. Oh, you have a little teaser. I'll, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. Okay. It's, uh, it's, I uh, believe, uh, probably why it has that. Oh, you have it right now. Yep. Why? Go ahead and play. This is a teaser. Is this kind of show the painting a little yeah, bit? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is a twelve-year project. Well, it's much longer than that. Twenty-year project of you deciding to make an image of using children from different cultures, ages, ethnicities, uh, and. The idea of mercy about the the, the probably I'm guessing the um, unfortunate um, results that children have to pay for adult and political decisions because made because children are our future yeah and this is what I want to project in this painting too because it's a, it's a, it's a very very powerful symbol because without uh, you know like we have to think of our children as our yeah. future All right well I go ahead and play that will you. Well, that's just a taste. That's just a little bit of an imaging that's not the full, complete uh, representation. You just right. sort of give them a little taste, little t right. tidbits right. of it. Right. I've seen it. Uh, it's gigantic. It's fascinating. It's a little disturbing because it's darkness is there and pain is there, but that's what children have always had to suffer based on political ideologies. It's a, it's a timeless idea. problem. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a timeless well, speaking of timelessness, um, I've had an amazing time with you, and, and I've never had an artist like of your caliber here, so it's been a, a, quite an hour. But I'm going to have you leave with this. You know, uh, you believe in God, as do I. You left a country that did not, in fact, believe in God in certain, and believed in worshiping of the state. You uh, have seen a lot of things, and your art has given you uh, the opportunity to be in front of very influential people. Uh, very famous people and so forth. Um, but I'm also thinking about this, but in the end, from the most, from Michelangelo to a garbage man, 
we're all in the same boat. We're all humans. We're just trying to figure it out. Some of them have giftedness, some, some don't. But some have neglected their gift. So I'm going to have you do this. I'm going to have you look into your camera, and I want you to simply, in your own words, however long you want to take, for the artists out there, maybe he's young, maybe he's old, who've given up, who said, nah, I'm not good enough. I don't think I deserve this, or I just, I don't think I have something worth, a story worth telling. Just maybe give them a little of an inspiration as, as to why they should know that their gift is enough and that they shouldn't relinquish it, but per fact, there's, perhaps there's a lot left in them. Give them some inspiration. You're a, a teacher of artists. Let them know that they're, they're not finished yet. Well, it's absolutely, it's very, very important. If you know that you have a gift, you have to, first of all, you have to work on it and you have to treasure it. And uh, um, because uh, that's the only way that you can, uh, your talent can be turned into the skill. And uh, uh, then through your talent and your skill, you can make the change in this world. You can, uh, as an artist, you can, uh, uh, um, uh, that's what makes us different because we see, we artists see the world slightly differently uh, than uh, the rest of people and uh, maybe more sensitively, more emotionally. But uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have, we can do something that nobody else can do, uh, like what I mean is like not, uh, I'm not comparing it to the uh, computer manipulated images or something to do by hand, like free hand uh, from your mind and your hand. And uh, if you can do something like this, it will be noticed. Sooner or later, it will be noticed. So you really have to just keep working on this and uh, believe in yourself. And uh, most important, believe in yourself. And, uh, and uh, with God's help, you know, it's going to happen. And, uh, but uh, you just got to keep on doing that. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the lots of determination, uh, hope, and faith. Igor Babalov. 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 <laughs> I'm it's so okay. sorry, folks. I, just, I, don't speak, <laughs> I don't speak Russian. But, folks, this is what we're trying to do on Brad Sanchez's issues. Bring on very important people, interesting people, creative people. We're all on the same boat, but the most important thing about this, beyond the artist and the uniqueness that you got to see, was that we have someone who came from an oppressive, suppressive uh, culture and overcame that and saw there was something better out there and that this nation, imperfect as it is, is still the last great hope on earth for freedom of speech, freedom of, of, of artistic acumen, freedom to express, freedom to push the envelope, freedom to jump over the boundaries and say there's more here, there's something greater here. God Almighty has given us the ability to remain here and to represent him when he said go forth and, and subdue the earth and take what I've given to you and replicate it. He said, make more. He literally said, make more humans. Do what I did in your own way. But this is what art is. It's a representation of God. Ex nihilo, from nothing, you can create something that wasn't there before, and it inspires us. And that's really what we cannot lose in America and in the world and in the West. Our culture is important. It should be honored and respected. And yeah, it's better than a lot of other cultures because it gave all the other cultures access to freedom. Not all of them returned the favor. And that's simply true. And that's why it's important for us to never forget what it means to be free, and to be American, to be part of this incredible culture of the West that brought the greatest art maybe humans have ever seen. So keep in mind, this is God's comic, Brad Stein. From Brad Stein has issues. If they tell you you're politically incorrect, always say thank you for the compliment because political correctness is cancer and it needs to die. We're all on this boat together. Let's fight. Let's be strong together. Join the militia of the mind. Be part of the mighty 10,000. The peasants revolt to stand up and be the people as the government of the United States to hang on to this greatest nation the world has ever known. And remember, folks, I'll be here every Monday night, 7 p.m., live, Central Standard Time, and doing what I always do. It's not complicated, but it's important. All I'm doing, putting the woke 
back to sleep. God bless you. See you next Monday.